Okay, ladies and gentlemen, you're all very welcome to this, the second day of the Foundation of the State Conference here in University College Dublin in the Fitzgerald Debating Chamber. Um, the order of business today is we're going to commence with an opening address by Dr. Morris Manning, the chair of the Expert Advisory Group, and then we're going to move directly into our first panel. Um, so. The question and answer will be done via an app called Slido at slido.com or if you go to centenaries.ucd.ie you will find the link to the Slido there and you can ask questions of the panel. Um, I'm going to hand over to our um, chair for, sorry, our introducer for our first session now, um, Dr. Morris Manning. So Dr. Morris Manning was elected Chancellor of the National University of Ireland in 2009. Um, he's been a member of the uh, University Senate um, since uh, since he, he uh, joined that particular body. He was uh, appointed as the chair of the Expert Advisory Group and Commemorations. And in that role, he successfully stewarded many of the initiatives um, at state and at more local levels, including in the key institutions of the state, including including the universities, um, through his, his work on that role. So he has been a driving force within the conference here today uh, in its setting up and in its steering through this. So it's very appropriate that Morris is addressed it today. And I'll hand over to Morris now. Thank you. Thanks, Connor. Uh, may I begin by thanking our hosts for this conference, uh, UCD, for the magnificent job they've been doing so far and no doubt will continue to do. This is the fifth national confer conference hosted by universities to mark the decade of centenaries. And the idea of the conferences was that all aspects of the decade would be examined in a scholarly, objective and independent way, ring-fenced from any external pressures all have been successful and this one promises to be a great success from what we saw yesterday now it is appropriate that ucd should be the setting for this topic the foundation of the state in her very elegant and perceptive opening speech vice president orla feely skillfully situated ucd's role in the entire independence struggle and of all the universities, its role was the most significant. It was precisely for such a role that the NUI and its colleges was established in 1908. They were the, it was the job of the universities, who else was going to do it? To provide the people with the skills, the education and the experience to make a reality of independence, uh, whatever shape, whether it was home rule or whatever shape it was going to take, it would need these people to make it work. UCD played a major part in that process as the Taoiseach somewhat wryly, I thought, uh, admitted yesterday, uh, maybe because he's a Cork graduate, it's difficult to give full enthusiasm for anything from UCD, but I'm being unfair here, I think. Uh, the Taoiseach did uh, acknowledge the part played in setting up the administration, government and so on, from U UCD. So I think it's appropriate then that UCD should be the setting for this seminar, these papers on the foundation of the state. So I want to thank Orla, Connor, and all the other, those who are, who are helping to prevent, to preserve UCD's generational contribution, uh, but also by remembering what the early UCD people contributed to the state. We're now coming to the closing stages of the decade of centenaries, and I'd like to reflect for a few moments on that decade and what has and maybe have, has not been achieved. The decade began with many difficult questions to be addressed and resolved. The overriding question was not just whether we as a people would not just have the courage, but also the willingness, the openness, the generosity of spirit, and most importantly of all, the skills to face up to and embrace our history in an honest, evidence-based, inclusive, and meaningful way. And if we revisit some of the media coverage of the time, there was no such confidence. Much of the media coverage focused on the difficulties we would face. 
with the memory of 1966, the 50th uh, anniversary of the 1916 rising in mind, there were predictions of political interference and manipulation. Many who wrote at the time feared the commemorations would be sub subsumed into current political events as used as, and used as a weapon to support current political positions and with the re endless replaying of old quarrels and inherited bitterness. And at the core of it all, there was a genuine, big and genuine concern. Would we be able to engage the people, the, to get the people to engage in a way that was credible and honest and informative, putting the people at ease with their own history, accepting it in its complexity, diversity, its failures, and its sometimes very unpalatable realities. I think we can say now that the skeptics were wrong. <coughs> the past decade has been a rich one in Irish historiography. If we judge the decade in terms of new research and publications, the emergence of a gifted, innovative and courageous new generation of scholars, the great broadening of boundaries of topics hitherto ignored or avoided, the role of women, treatment of minorities, difficult social and societal issues, arts and culture, to name but a few. Much of the work to date has been truly groundbreaking, and it will continue. And we should also note the contribution of the media with well-researched TV and radio documentaries, many of a very high quality, and also many newspaper supplements. Less obvious, maybe, but of enormous importance have been the initiatives of our local authorities. With government support, local authorities have pioneered many often imaginative initiatives as they examine the impact of the events of the decade on their own communities. And I should mention also the contribution of local history societies as communities came to terms with their own stories. I want to mention here the fear I referred to earlier that there would be a rerun of 1966 with government dictating events. That has not happened. Some have even criticised the government for not being proactive enough. But from the outset, the decision of then Taoiseach Enda Kenny that events would be ring-fenced from government and political interference has been honoured. That is not to say the government has not been supportive. The, organize, the organisers of today's conference and of the other conferences will agree with me that the Department of, and get all its names, Tourism, Arts, Culture, Heritage, the Great and Sports, uh, has been enthusiastically supportive and financially helpful without any editorial input whatsoever. And just as it has been with all of the national conferences, and also in its support, financial support, of so many of the other initiatives of the decade. And I want to give full credit to the department, not just for its practical support, but for its enthusiastic and positive attitude to all that we, the committee, tried to do over the past decade. Now, of course, there have been controversies and disagreements and criticisms. That was inevitable. But to me, the most striking feature of the decade so far is that there is no holding back. No topic was off bounds from the question of Irish soldiers in the Great War at the outset through to the Civil War and to, and to today's events. Everything was on the table. The archives were opened, all points of view were accommodated, painful episodes were aired and evaluated. And to the great credit of all, we gave each other the space and respect that was required. The last word on the present topic I leave to Simon Sharma, the historian who wrote recently in the Financial Times that the two countries in Europe who have best handled their recent history are Germany and Ireland. Unlike other countries, we have not sought to weaponize our history, but to treat it with respect. This conference, which got off to such a good start yesterday, looks in details and perspective at what may have been the greatest achievement of the decade of centenaries, the successful foundation of the state. Yes, of course, and there are many things that can and will be said. It was not the state that everybody wanted. 
uh, and as the Taoiseach pointed out yesterday very fairly, it was a state which evinced no great enthusiasm, no great celebrations at the time. Uh, it, all, it almost surreptitiously came into existence. Uh, for many, it was a truncated version with an unresolved boundaries. For others, it fell short of a full republic. For others, it lacked social vis vision. And of course, of course, its establishment led to civil war. But the fact is that the state did survive. Very few states are born out of an immaculate conception. The foundation of all states is messy, often turning into violence, often unsuccessful, often the first start doesn't work and uh, sometimes overturned before they begin. So there is no easy recipe for the foundation of a state. But the Irish state was founded, it did survive, it did sustain. Parliamentary politics won. Within four years of the end of the Civil War, all major political groups were working within Parliament and accepting the unqualified legitimacy of that Parliament. We are one of the very few countries in the world where that has happened and one of the longest sustaining democracies. We sometimes take for granted, or in some cases are dismissive, dismissive of the enormity of what was achieved in such a short space of time. Well, the successes, the failures, the omissions and the consequences is what we are examining here yesterday and today. And may I say we have a full and interesting day ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Morris, for those wonderful words that I think really set and train a conversation that will continue throughout today, both here in the room, among our speakers, and with our online audience. It's my great pleasure to introduce our first panel of today, who are going to speak on the topic of a stake in the state, welfare, health, and gender. And I'd like to remind both our in-person audience and our online audience that you can now see a QR code that you can scan either here in the room or online by holding your phone uh, camera up to your screen and scanning that QR code. And this will allow you to ask questions in real time during the speaker's papers or afterwards. So we'd like to gain as much interaction as possible between you, the audience, and the great uh, thoughts and speakers that we have here today. So I don't want to take up too much time, so I'm just going to introduce the speakers and the names of their talks. Our first speaker of today is Professor Emeritus Ma Mary E. Daly of the UCD School of History. Her paper will be No Promised Land, Health and Welfare in the Early Years of the Irish Free State. Then we will move to Dr. Mary McAuliffe, who is Director of Gender Studies and also at the UCD School of Social Policy, Social Work and Social Justice. Her paper is entitled Not in the Mainstream, The Political Afterlives of Revolutionary Women. And the final paper on today's panel will be Dr. Joseph Brady of the UCD School of Geography. His paper is A New Beginning, dealing with Dublin's housing crisis in the 1920s. So without much further ado, I'm going to hand over to Professor Daly, who will commence today's proceedings with her first paper. Thank you very much. And I'm delighted to see so many people in the room. I thought it was going to be a cosy conversation between Morris Connor and myself. Um, but uh, anyway, you, you, you are terrific. Um, yesterday in the opening address, Micheál Martin said, talking about the 6th and 7th of December 1922, the first two days of the Irish Free State, that the poetry and idealism seems to have been gone. Uh, and I'm afraid I'm keeping in that theme today, though looking in, on a, at very different material. While nobody will argue that economic arguments were, co were the primary case for an independent Ireland, most people did think that independence would improve their living conditions. Uh, and during the late 19th century, Irish nationalist politicians could justifiably claim that the amount that Ireland paid in taxation was greater than what was spent within Ireland at the time. But that had changed by 1912. Public spending was now significantly higher than tax revenue. The main cause was the old age pension introduced 
in 1909, which cost two and a half million almost a year, uh, which was one quarter of the entire tax take at the time. The other one, incidentally, which I'm not going to talk about, is postal deliveries to every house, which was introduced during Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee. Um, British Labour Unionist, Liberal Unionist Austin Chamberlain believed that the pensions have solved the Irish question because they made home rule financially unsustainable. The leadership of the Irish party were all too conscious that old age pensions had really wrecked the financial basis for a home rule Ireland. Uh, good, it worked. In 1911, Tom Kettle, a UCD professor of uh, national economics, home rule MP, wrote that, as you can see it there, under Home Rule, Ireland will resume the right to frugality now denied her. I don't know that that is what people who were campaigning for Home Rule, the ordinary punter in Ireland, was really looking for. Some of the Home Rule leadership, and I'm thinking particularly of Erskine Childers, uh, is suggested that old age pensions would have to be halved if Ireland was to balance its books at the time. While civil war seriously damaged public finances, um, the cost to the army, the damage to property and the general damage to the economy, the financial problems of an independent Ireland were systemic, they predated all that, and more importantly they would have applied to a 32 county Ireland as well. So health and welfare were major targets for cuts in public spending. A further challenge that an independent Ireland was facing, and it requires a lot more thought than I have time to give it today. In the years before 1914, Britain is moving away from the poor law model, which is one of minimal support to the truly destitute, and nothing if you're not truly destitute, to providing a, a social insurance that will give you guaranteed welfare as a right. A, a, in other words, without the need to prove that you are a dependent and impoverished and to grovel for your support. But that insurance model was difficult to deploy in an Irish free state, which was dominated by peasant farmers, self, uh, relatives assisting and small businesses. In 1929, as I think most of you know, the first Dáil approved the democratic programme, which sets out a very a, a high level aspiration about ending poverty, looking after children and getting, uh, and getting rid of the degrading and foreign poor law, replacing it with a sympathetic native scheme and a, for the nation's aged and infirm who were entitled to the nation's gratitude. That was rhetoric, uh, nothing more. The primary motivation for closing the workhouses was to save money. And more to the point, the model that was used for workhouse for poor law reform came not from a, a, a Dáil Éireann, but it came, it came, sorry, I'm messing my pages, came not just from, didn't come from Dáil Éireann, it came actually from the British establishment. Uh, the two uh, reports on the poor law in the early 20th century. They recommended an end to workhouses, all-purpose institutions that had, took in the elderly, the infirm, those with intellectual and physical disabilities, mentally ill, tramps, unmarried mothers, deserted wives and their children, everybody under one roof. Irish workhouses also included a, work, a hospital that provided care for the locals who were not necessarily destitute. You could go to the workhouse hospital and you got local hospital care uh, without having to be destitute. And almost all of those hospitals were run by nuns who were brought in by landlords because they were cheap and because they could do, do, do a good job in maintaining hygiene and other standards. The reforms that were set out envisaged moving people more into the community, sending those who were sick, disabled, mentally ill or unmarried mothers to specialist institutions. Poor law unions based around larger towns would be replaced by a county-based system, which also was problematic. The poor law unions were based around market towns, they ignored county boundaries, and, and you're now putting in a county-based system which doesn't recognise economic realities, transport and other networks at the time at all. The reforms were highly successful in achieving savings. Um, in the years 1924 to 25, spending on poor relief, I've given you the figures there, spending on poor relief fell by a roughly a quarter between 1913 and 1925. The numbers in workhouses fell, the numbers getting outdoor assistance rose, but the numbers relieved in total fell by almost 5%. The Commission on the Sick and 
and indigent poor suggested that the fall in the numbers who were being relieved wasn't necessarily a good thing. They were convinced that more might have needed relief and that the system was obviously too draconian. Now, nobody could object to closing workhouses or substituting care in the community, but workhouses didn't really disappear. Better to say that they were rebranded. The 131 poor law unions uh, were replaced by roughly 28 county health authorities. There were three poor law unions still in existence in Dublin. So there were almost 100 fewer workhouses slash county homes by the mid-1920s. In 1910, only one place in four was occupied in the average workhouse. In other words, they were, they were, they were largely empty. But the massive reduction in institutions meant that uh, they were seriously overcrowded by 1925. And most importantly, they continued to house the same assortment of poor, elderly, sick and neglected people, many of them the outcasts of Irish society. In 1926, the county home in Ennis contained, and I'm using the language of the time, you may, not, you may find it offensive, 112 lunatics and imbeciles and idiots, plus 18 people with tuberculosis. And there was an infirmary, even though there was a hospital about a mile away, and there was a maternity unit. The county home was so overcrowded that the incapacitated elderly who wanted to be admitted might have traveled and might have traveled up to 40 miles from West Clare were being turned away because there was no space for them. Residents who were mentally ill couldn't be sent to the mental hospital because the mental hospital was even more overcrowded. A hospital with accommodation for 250 had over 500 inmates at the time. The Ennis Mental Hospital also contained a cohort of TB patients. What we're seeing there is the stigma of TB, get them out to somewhere else if you can. And these TB patients were mingling freely with staff and other residents and a lot of the staff became tubercular as a consequence. Many of the inmates in the mental hospital had recovered and should have gone home, but they had nowhere to go. Families wouldn't take them back in many cases because of the stigma associated with mental illness. Others, such as single men and women or elderly people whose children had emigrated, had nowhere that they could go. The county homes also accommodated the homeless, including a lot of former domestic servants and live-in farm labourers whose home had been their place of work. When they were too old to work, they became homeless. Other residents were elderly people who couldn't survive on their own, but their children had emigrated. And as I said, TB cases showed people First of all, there was a lack of space in sanatoria, and the sanatoria generally didn't take the seriously ill TB cases. They took the ones that they thought they could treat. We don't have any accurate descriptions of conditions in workhouses pre-1914, but the visits by the Commission of the Sick and Destitute Poor in 25-26 confirm that most county homes, mental hospitals and county hospitals were in appalling condition. No sanitation, no adequate heat, no running water. The West Cork County Home in Tonakilty was, quote, one of the most primitive institutions in the country. The commission was, quote, doubtful whether it had been improved since it had been built in the 1840s. Uh, the chairman of Clare County Council said that all the hospitals in the county were falling down. Many had been damaged during the War of Independence and Civil War, but I have a strong suspicion that they were in pretty bad condition pre-1914. In 1930, the medical officer in the county hospital in Ennis described trying to carry out surgery while nurses held candles over his head. The cost of health and welfare service, with the exception of the old age pension and unemployment insurance, fell on the local authorities. Rate collapse, collection collapsed during the War of Independence and Civil War, and there were massive arrears. Agricultural prices fell in the 1920s. Farmers who'd enjoyed a boom period during World War I and had often borrowed and spent unwisely were in difficulties and they were demanding rates relief. In Britain, to make it worse, in Britain and Northern Ireland, agricultural land was relieved of 75% of the rates bill in 1923 and fully due rated in 1928. In the Irish Free State, 72% of total rates was levied on land. Outside the major cities, the figure was over 80%. So derating agricultural land was utterly impossible. Local authorities faced a major backlash if they increased taxes, and they found it almost impossible to borrow money for capital improvements. The Department of Finance, John's pet project, uh, blocked local loans because any money that could be raised was needed to keep the government afloat. It was harder for local authorities to borrow money in the 1920s than at any stage since the foundation of the Local Government Board in 1872. 
I'm now going to move on to support in the community, looking at home assistance and the old age pension. The planned reduction in numbers in the workhouse or county home envisaged more people being supported on home assistance in the community. Home assistance was formerly known as outdoor relief. It had again been rebranded. Home assistance retained all the appalling features of the 19th century workhouse. People had no right to assistance. Claimants were investigated and policed. Anonymous letters from nosy neighbours came into play a lot of the time. There was considerable power and patronage attached to it a, for local officials. An applicant would have to apply to a local councillor or get a doctor or priest to apply on their behalf. Recipients had to queue weekly for their money. Sometimes they were given vouchers that could only be spent in a shop owned by a local councillor. Some of those most in need, and there's considerable proof to this, wouldn't apply because it was such a humiliating experience. In 1925, uh, sorry, I haven't, uh, that didn't, yeah. In, in 1925, and I'll explain this to you in a moment, 57% of those receiving it, uh, sorry, do I have another slide? Let's go back. No, I don't. Sorry, I must have left our slide. No, yeah, sorry about that. In, 19, in 1926, 57% of recipients of, of home assistance were permanently disabled by age and infirmity, but below the old age pension age of 70. It tells you something about the tough lives for, for manual workers at the time. Uh, interesting in terms of the discussion of the pension age now today. Uh, many of them had TB and couldn't work for that reason. 14% were widows with dependent children, 6% were able-bodied men with dependents. There was another miscellaneous category. With the exception of those who were certified as permanently disabled in body or mind, home assistance was only granted for a month and it had to be reviewed and almost reapplied for every month. If you were permanently disabled, you were reviewed every three months and you might be asked to carry out work tests to prove that you really were disabled. Now, quite how widows' circumstances could change every month, I still don't know. But anyway... These practices were endorsed particularly by the finance minister. Ernest Blythe told the Doyle, there is undoubtedly this to be in, said in favour of home assistance in a country which is poor and there can be some measure of discrimination. And if only you could arrange to have that discrimination sympathetically exercised and remove objectionable features, we might do a great deal of good. It was much cheaper to give home assistance than keep somebody in the county home, which would have cost about a pound, 20 shillings a, a week. In 1926-27, you've got the figures there, a two-thirds of claimants received less than 7.5, 7 and 6, 7.5 shillings a, at the time. And in almost half those cases, there were two people relying on it. Um, I've given you, I'll talk about the pension thing in a moment. Uh, the Commission on the Sick and Destitute Poor, which was not a hotbed of socialism, uh, concluded that in order to survive, those on home assistance had to get supplementary support either from charity or begging. And the fact that they mentioned begging as a potential means for their support, I think, is very revealing of the Irish society of the time. They concluded that the small sums paid in home assistance showed that county boards of health and public assistance were failing to discharge their obligation to provide people with the means to pay for food, clothing, housing and heating. Like most of our society at the time, this commission distinguished very clearly between the deserving and undeserving poor. The 7,000 widows with dependent children who were in home assistance were the most deserving. They suggested that they shouldn't have to line up with these other less deserving recipients to get their money. They also favoured widows' pensions. And again, the pressure's coming there because in 1926, widows' pensions were introduced in Britain and Northern Ireland for those paying social insurance. We didn't get them here until 19. 35 when a non-contributory one was introduced. Ernest Blythe, a Minister of Finance, 1922-32, is remembered as the man who cut the old age pensions. Um, old age pensions were designed to give the elderly people a reasonable weekly payment you did, that was not associated with the poor law. You didn't have to be destitute to obtain it. Pensions were means tested and the amount was calculated accordingly. But you had a right to a pension if you had modest means. That's the critical thing about it. There's no corresponding right to poor relief. You have to prove you're absolutely destitute. The most important thing I want to say to you, the, the old age pension was never intended to be 100% support for these people. There's 
The notion of figures were worked out in 1923 that the pensioner needed a pound a week to survive, 20 shillings. Uh, and the pension would, a uh, maximum pension would, would top you up to that. You, in other words, you expected to roughly 10 shillings or so in, in means. It could be you owned your house, you were living with some, with, with family, you had, a, you had a turf bank or a, 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 you know, a cow or something like that. So I think when you look at it in those terms, they, they accepted that it cost roughly, uh, a, roughly a pound a week to survive and they are giving only, they're giving about a third of that money to people on, on, employ, on, on outdoor assist, relief even though some of, a lot of them are supporting two people. I think it shows you how deplorable that sum of money was. Now, Ireland did extraordinarily well out of the old age pension. Because of emigration, the proportion of older people was high. The fact that there was no civil registration of births in Ireland before 1864 meant that you could fiddle your age. Go look at the 1901-1911 census and you'd be amazed the number of people that were 15 years older by 1911 than they were in 1901. You know, if, if you were 45 in 1901, one, you kind of added 15 to get yourself within striking distance. Uh, and that's incidentally where they, the Night of the Big Wind comes from. Ah, yeah, but I remember the Night of the Big Wind. If you did, you would be old enough for the pension. Um, the local, uh, your entitlement to a pension was determined by the local committee. They, they examined your circumstances and how much you got. But as the cost fell, fell on central government, they were quite generously disposed towards granting them, much more than if they'd fallen on the rates. In 1923, old age pensions cost just under 20% of the total budget. Today, the whole health expenditure is about 11%, just as a matter of comparison. As I said, the maximum pension was 10 shillings a week. Finance wanted to cut it by a quarter. In 1924, it was reduced by a shilling. The allowances for other sources of support were, tight, were tightened up. The numbers receiving the pension fell by 6% in one year, expenditure fell by almost 20%, and only two-thirds got the maximum pension compared with three quarters previously. Although the cuts were partly restored some years previously, if your pensioners got, they got the, got the full amount. Pensions were really important. Uh, in 1926, there were 114,000 pensioners, 67,000 were women, and they enabled elderly people to live in the community. Families, including more distant relatives, became keen to have a resident pensioner. The number of workhouse residents fell by one-fifth when the pension was introduced. In 1926, one household in four west of the Shannon had a pensioner resident there. The money was actually used for bringing in some cash to the place. So it's easy to understand why Blythe was vilified even by members of Commonwealth. While the economy was a key driver behind, while the economy, oh sorry, I should have put that one up. While the economy was a key driver behind the parsimonious approach to health and welfare spending, it wasn't the only factor behind this mindset. Many national or local politicians favoured a limited role for the state, believing that families and charities should bear much of the cost of relieving poverty. This reflects Catholic social teaching. It also reflects the conservative values of farmers and self-employed businessmen who dominated much of Irish society. Some local authorities in the 1920s wanted to hand all responsibility for home assistance over to the Society for St Vincent de Paul, but they retorted that their primary purpose was to save the souls of their members. They just weren't an organisation to assist the poor. I'm amazed at the number of religious references we've managed to get in at this conference. Um, the Commission on the Sick and Destitute Poor rejected proposals that the Vincent de Paul Society and local authorities should compile a joint register of those they assisted because they feared that that would expose the poverty of the decent poor, eh, who might be less willing to seek charity in the future. This implies that some decent poor didn't apply for home assistance. Um, applications to the Mentary Pensions Bureau show the extent to which Irish people were often dependent on support from family members. And I'm not talking about husband and his children and wife, but I'm thinking of adult women and men who supported their parents, nieces, nephews, sisters and brothers who might be tubercular, disabled or ill. If you look at the files, that's the story that really comes through to me. So we shouldn't be surprised at the low and late marriages in Ireland at the time, given that many of these single earners had a huge number of their birth family reliant on them. 
Those who fared worst in Ireland in the 1920s and for many decades after were those who had no family to fall back on or they had sinned against the social conventions of the society and their families and were rejected accordingly. Given the parsimonious uh, approach to public spending, it's not surprising that Ireland lagged behind neighbouring counties in improvements in countries, sorry, in improvements in health and life expectancy during the 20s and 30s. Up until the 1920s, life expectancy in Ireland was higher than in Britain. Rural was better than urban. Uh, from the 1920s onwards, Ireland falls behind and it falls behind most of Europe. It was better than France and places like that in the 1920s, it's way behind them, and Italy was way behind them in the 1950s. Uh, you get again mortality from a, a TB, a, again heading in all the wrong directions, a much, be, a much better improvements, and it's lower and improving more rapidly in Northern Ireland and other parts of the United Kingdom. Um, and, um, and I think the statistic that really stares out most is the one about the urban rural division. In 1941, a child born in Connacht, which was poor, had 10 years longer life expectancy than a boy born in Dublin, age of 45. He has five or six years longer life expectancy than his Dublin counterpart as well. When the lead, um, when legislation was being introduced in Dáil Éireann to appoint county medical officers, uh, this is in 1925, the Minister for Local Government, Seamus Burke, justified the appointment of county medical officers by claiming they would improve animal health and protect exports. He didn't refer to human health at all. Now, there was a case to be answered about bovine TB, but there were so many cases to be answered about humans as well. The power to appoint county medical officers was permissive. A county didn't have to do it, and some didn't. And the county medical officer could be very active in school medicals, immunisation, all the rest of it, or they could be very laggard, and some sadly were at the time. Now, there were improvements in the 1930s, beginning around 1930 or thereabouts. Local authorities could borrow money for water and sanitary services and hospital improvements again. Though ratepayers were very, very reluctant to spend. The hospital sweepstake gave substantial grants towards building uh, or, or uh, improving county homes and some mental hospitals. County homes ranked low on the list. Uh, county hospitals got the money, some mental hospitals, county homes ranked very low on the priorities. There were almost no institutions catering for those with intellectual disabilities, so these most neglected adults and children remained in the county homes well into the 1960s. In the 1950s and even the 1960s, many county homes were largely unchanged from the 1920s. There was no running water in Clannacilty in the early 1960s. Means-tested, non-contributory widows' pensions were introduced. They weren't generous, but they were right. The number of pensions awarded was rapidly four times the number who had got home assistance, again indicating that many widows who were very impoverished had either been refused home assistance or wouldn't apply for it because of the humiliation. From 1934, unemployment assistance, the Dole, was a great beneficiary to poorer rural households who again avoided home assistance. The relatives assisting, the farmer's son who couldn't get much to do in the winter months was a particular beneficiary, more money into those rural households. But major improvements in health demanded more spending on housing, water and sanitation. Um, now I'm going to conclude. Gareth Fitzgerald, who is commemorated in this lecture theatre, suggested this in the early 1970s, that Ireland became independent just in time because the expansion of British social spending in later years would have made the cost of independence insurmountable. And frankly, if agricultural derating had been introduced in 1914, it would have proved impossible to sustain locally funded health and welfare services. You would have taken the whole financial basis out. But the story of Irish health and welfare goes beyond tax taxable capacity. It reflects a vision of a subsidiary state where charities and families are expected to assume major responsibilities. In 1932, Sean Kelly, minister, who was Minister for Local Government and Public Health, it was responsible for all these services that I've been talking about. In a speech to the Society of St. Vincent de Paul, sets out you know, what he believes is the position. that It's the duty of the state to come to the aid of the infirm, the poor and the hungry. Uh, but if you're raising money by taxes of any kind to do that, you are taking 
you are a t putting a tax on national income and you're making it more difficult to solve poverty. In other words, O'Kelly believed that the state should solve the fundamental problem of poverty, but shouldn't get too worried about the interim maintenance period. Uh, and he felt that voluntary social bodies could give sorely needed help uh, to the state by doing that relief. Their methods were more flexible, more sympathetic than purely official agencies, and they continue to encourage a spirit of thrifty independence in the population. So what I want to suggest to you is the system that we put in place in the 1920s was not particularly kind to Ireland's most needed, and it also cast a long shadow over our society. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mary. Our next paper. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mary. Our next paper is Dr. Mary McAuliffe on Not in the Mainstream, the Political Afterlives of Revolutionary Women. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Connor, and, and everybody who has been involved in organizing this wonderful conference. And we had some great papers yesterday. Um, and as my title says, uh, what I'm talking about today is the afterlives of many of the revolutionary women that you see in the photograph on, on the slide there. In 1970, trade union activist and 1916 rebel Rosie Hackett was presented with a gold badge by the ITGWU in recognition of her long service with the union. In an interview marking the occasion, she said that if only Mr. Connolly uh, we're still living, women would not be in the backward position that we are in today. Whether or not Connolly, if he had survived, would have managed to influence Ireland to be a better country for women is not an issue I'm going to look at here. But what is interesting is that Hackett could say in 1970 that women were still in a backward position. And she was not the only revolutionary women, woman who felt this, and indeed others had talked of Ireland as no country for women at a much earlier stage. For instance, the militant suffrage campaigner Hannah Shee Skeffington wrote in 1932 uh, on the change of government and the incoming leader of Fianna Fáil. She said that, I have no belief in de Valera, well-meaning of course, better than Cosgrave, but essentially conservative and church-bound, anti-feminist, bourgeois and the like. Obviously, Hannah didn't, wasn't too impressed with Dev uh, as he was coming into government. What I wish to look at here today is the question posed in my title, not in the mainstream, through the lens of gender and more particularly the public and private afterlives of political suffrage and revolutionary women. Firstly, I wish to make a brief reflection on how this decade of centenaries has impacted on both the commemorative landscape and the continuing transformation of, of our researching and writing of the histories of the Irish revolutionary and post-revolutionary period. We need, I would argue, to question the usefulness of commemoration in aiding our understanding of other, more troubling aspects of Irish women's and marginalised histories. Can these commemorative events lead to a broad, broader inclusion of, for instance, more inconvenient female bodies in modern Irish history, and to help highlight a, dis, uh, um, a discounting, until relatively recently, of the physical, emotional, sexual, obstetric and institutional violences done to women in both the revolutionary period and in the post-revolutionary Irish state? Institutionalization of memory, of course, is shaped by political, cultural and ideological concerns and gendered hierarchies of importance. Contemporary politics impacts on how we do commemoration, who we remember and why, as well as what we commemorate. Impacted in no small way by a revitalized feminist movement, by contemporary concerns about violence against women, by ongoing revelations of the specifically gendered nature of the violence of institutionalization and a growing understanding that the Irish War of Independence and the Civil War were not, in the case of women, clean wars. Um, we, we see that gendered violence against women in these histories is no longer a question of if it happened, but how, why, where, to whom, and by whom, and what were the impacts and legacies. How these gendered, violences, uh, gendered histories of violence are dealt with in a commemorative and memorial practices vary, however. As these uh, memories shift and change, 
the impacts of politics and ideologies and how, who and what we commemorate changes. So how important is the impact of contemporary feminism or anti-racism or LGBT rights or other progressive activist movements on commemorative and memorial spaces and the writings of these new histories? And I think we have to remember that as we move on from this decade of centenaries. Because now many historians and others are advocating the importance of researching and analysing revolutionary afterlives. How do the revolutionary women, for instance, fit in a counter-revolutionary, conservative, patriarchal, free state dominated by the alliance of church and state? Despite the promise of full and equal citizenship in the proclamation of 1916, it soon became apparent that ideologically, uh, the new state found the activities of public, political and activist women highly problematic. Uh, the legislative attacks on equal citizenship, which had been guaranteed uh, in the 1922 constitution, was in keeping with the masculinized ideology of men as leaders and rulers and women as passive followers, developed during the late 19th and early 20th century. As acknowledged by Katrina Bowman, Louise Ryan and Mary Clancy in their exploration of the life cycles of the suffrage movement and its afterlife in the free state, they write that despite the guarantee of equal uh, gender equality in the 1922 Free State Constitution, it soon became clear that gender discrimination would continue to negatively impact the lives of Irish women. Nor was it just the Come and the Gael government. In her study of women's experiences in the 1920s and 1930s, Marianne Valoulis writes, De Valera's ideal woman was also passive. She had no work of her own to do, and this bespeaks an air of self-effacement, of meekness, of indirectness. What it lacks is passion, vitality, independence and assertiveness. What it does not incorporate is a public identity for women. And that's what I want to look at. How did these women who were so active in the revolutionary movement uh, continue to have, if they did have indeed, a public identity? And the conservatism of the free state can indeed be seen as a response to the chaos of the War of Independence and the bitter conflicts of the Civil War. It was not only brother against brother, it was also at that time sister against sister, so women were very much involved in the Civil War. But this conservatism was also a determined attempt to restore what was considered a traditional order and hierarchy. Because the first few decades of the 20th century had seen women emerge in greater numbers from the, political, from the domestic sphere and participate in the hitherto male-dominated public realm. The activities of these women in the struggle for Irish freedom had been essential and indeed an integral part of that cause. And now, as, as this decade has shown in research over the last number of decades, uh, women are being rewritten back into uh, that revolutionary struggle in, in a way that is very, very important. For many of these women, influenced by the ideologies of feminism and nationalism, the expectation was that a free Ireland would guarantee them equal citizenship. For the state, however, the ideal Irish woman was above all a wife and a mother. The home and the heart were to be her sphere of influence. Irish women's citizenship became, as Valulis noted, rooted in the private sphere and directly related to motherhood within marriage. Thirdly, the dominance of the ideology of domesticity is reflected in the growing influence of the Catholic Church, which in its sermons and literature throughout the 1920s railed against the deterioration of the world in general uh, and Irish women in particular. As uh, Maria Luddy has written, it is evident uh, from these uh, uh, um, pamphlets and literature that there is a growing focus on women on women, in particular their appearance and presence in public life, which is deemed to have upset the moral order and has the uh, potential to continue to upset that order. So the 1920s marked a low point for political women in many ways, as they were offered little or no role in the state. Those who were being active in the period prior to 1922 either retired from active politics if, uh, or if they were elected because they were anti-treaty, they did not take their seat. Or indeed, if they were not in mainstream politics, they concentrated in so, in, on social, health, education, community and cultural issues. For instance, Dr. Kathleen Lynn, 
who was a commander of the City Hall garrison in 1916 and an activist from early on in feminism and, uh, uh, and militant nationalism, now put all her energies into the founding and running of St. Alton's Hospital for Six Children. Although an elected TD, because she was anti-treaty, she never did take her seat in the Doyle, although she does work actively in local government, is very much involved in social housing uh, and other issues at a local level. Others like Hannah Shee Skeffington and Louis Bennett continue to agitate on women's issues, but from outside and with little or no influence on legislation. According to Fisher, underpinning the construction of Ireland's new emergent nation state was a national imaginary that needed to clearly differentiate Irish identity uh, from British identity. This impacts on women in ways because the, tax, uh, the task is undertaken through recourse to the themes of purity, chastity, and virtue. So female identities, even those of political and public women, were publicly constrained by gender norms, informed by faith-based and secular conservative ideals. Indeed, as many historians of Irish women's political and social history have shown, from 1922, there was a rigorous and ongoing legislative attempt uh, to undermine uh, women's position as equal citizen. The decade 1922 to 32 had seen the stabilizing of the democratic principles, and this is one of the, the, the great achievements, I suppose, of the setting up of the free state. Um, as our, our first speaker said, you know, there were some really good things about this state that came, in, came into being, and the fact that it has for 100 years continued to be a stable democracy is indeed in itself a great achievement. But it, was, it had also seen the constant chipping away at the civil rights of women and the promotion of the dominant discourses of women in the home. Where the right to work outside the home, the right to control fertility and reproduction, and access to power by women was regulated and restricted. Uh, uh, there's about 15 different pieces of legislation between 1922 and 1937, when the new constitution comes into being, uh, that chip away at women's position in various uh, parts of the public realm. These include uh, things like the 1929 Censorship of Publication Acts, which banned advertising on contraception. Morris Curtis's study of militant Catholicism in Ireland demonstrated the extent to which Catholic lay organisations and the Catholic clergy were concerned about how, uh, and I quote, knowledge of sex and contraception could be culled from birth control literature and sex manuals, so they had to be uh, censored. This led to a campaign to control access to this type of literature and censor any information. As outlined by Sandra McAvoy, Opponents of birth control gained e early successes when they influenced the 1926 Evil Literature Committee and the subsequent 1927 uh, Censorship of Publications Act. Both led to very effective censorship of birth control information, while continued pressure from those opposed to any access to contraceptives gained more success with the passing of the 1935 Civil or Criminal Law Amendment Act. And this is the, that's just um, a few examples of the type of legislation that was introduced between 22 and uh, 37 that chipped away at women's ability to uh, participate in the public realm, to control their own fertility, uh, to work outside the home. Of course, the Civil Service Amendment Act controlled that with introductions of a marriage bar uh, and other aspects of legislation which uh, contained and controlled women. Domesticity, respectability and marital reproduction were the vital contributions of women to the well-being of the nation. And as noted by Geraldine Meany, in a post-colonial Southern Ireland, this particular construction of sexual and familial rule became the very substance of what it meant to be Irish, and indeed, particularly what it meant to be an Irish woman. Not only did legislation and religious teaching define a marital, maternal and domestic role for Irish women, the narrow construct of acceptable femininity was also recognised in the Irish Constitution. Article 41 of the Constitution of Ireland, 1937, and it doesn't come out of anywhere. Uh, you know, the constitution that we rail against today about the women in the home articles is actually reflecting a society that already exists. So De Valera uh, and those uh, authors of the constitution are not creating something new. They define an acceptable model of family as the primary and fundamental unit of society, decreeing it as a moral institution possessing inalienable and imprescribable rights antecedent and superior to all positive law. 
This article is followed by further insertions known as the Women in the Home Articles, which of course are still in our constitution, which are essentially prescriptive definitions of women's place in society. They recognise that by her life in the home, women gives to the state a support without which the common good cannot be achieved, and furthermore, that the state would ensure that mothers shall not be obliged by economic necessity to engage in labour to the neglect of their duties in the home. But of course, as Mary has shown in her first paper, a lot of this was rhetoric uh, and none of it actually had real impact and, and no woman in the home was getting enough money really to stay there. A free state in which uh, the prescribed gender view of citizenship of women were not free. Indeed, it was no country for women. Despite all this, and, and I don't want to end a depressing note, there were resistances. Many public women who campaigned for the three great causes as defined by Countess Markovitch, women, labour and Ireland, continued their activism on into the free state. While there were no feminists in the Doyle, and indeed, for uh, large chunks of the 1920s, there was only one woman, Margaret Collins O'Driscoll, who was Michael Collins' sister, who, didn't, who in fact actually said she was not a feminist uh, and followed party lines. We did in the Senate have a number of very uh, vocal women who continued to support and commit themselves to the cause of equality. These were Senators Jenny Wise Power, Kathleen Clark, and Eileen Costello, and interestingly, uh, Wise Power and Costello had been pro-treaty and Kathleen Clark had been anti-treaty, but they combined together through the late 1920s and into the 1930s against uh, the new enemy, the actual uh, patriarchal state in which they were living. And they emerged as the most committed to the cause of equality for women in Irish society, where they supported campaigns to counteract or change the legislation which they perceived as unjust to women, workers, landless labourers, or the poor. At the centre of power in the Irish Free State, these women articulated to their male colleagues the campaigns of civil society feminist groups who were active outside of, of uh, the Oireachtas. Often allied with these women's groups, they brought the concerns of the activists about the constant uh, subversion of their rights as citizens to the upper echelons of political power. While the Senate women were unable to fully submerge the, this dominance, I mean, they did have one win in the 1925 Juries Act and they, they uh, softened some pieces of legislation, but mostly they, they were railing against a, a state that rode roughshod over the uh, rights of women. They do promote the idea that public women had a right to contribute to politics and the economy. Wise Power, Clark and Costello, all of whom had been active prior to the setting up of the Free State, Wise Power and Clark, of course, among the founder members of Come and Amman. Eileen Costello had been a cultural nationalist. Uh, all of them had fought campaign for the vote for women. Um, they, along with many feminist organisations and women's groups, who continued their public activism against anti-women legislation uh, in their opposition, for example, to the 1937 Constitution. Even as De Valera uh, introduced, sorry, I'm running behind on my, there's the Lynn Diaries. Even as De Valera introduced a new constitution which would place women firmly in the home, these political women clung, clung to the promises of 1916 and they go back to that again and again and you can see that on their speeches. And they continue the battles for full and equal citizenship. Outside of this mainstream politics, however, there were main, it was mainly in the areas of social care, education, medicine and social justice that revolutionary women found their political afterlife. The diaries of Dr. Kathleen Lynn, I'll go back to you there, uh, provide an insight into her social and political life and her relationship with many of the key political figures of the time. They demonstrate the revolutionary socialist and feminist fervour of the pre-1922 radical women, what motivated them and the work they did for women, workers in Ireland. The diaries also reveal the difficult road these radical women had to forge in the new free state, which viewed these women through the constraining lens of marriage, motherhood and domesticity, and indeed saw women like Lynn as threats to the establishment. And you would see that in many of the battles that Dr. Lynn had with the establishment, including her effort to found a National Children's Hospital uh, in, in the 1940s. Um, and uh, there is a campaign now, of course, to call the new National Children's Hospital after Dr. Kathleen Lynn. Another revolutionary woman was Margaret Skinner. She had fought in 1916, published her memoir, Doing My Bit for Ireland, in 1917, 
uh, was, was a member of Coming Amon, Fairview, Coming Amon through the War of Independence and did all that Coming Amon did. Ended up in jail uh, during the Civil War in Mountjoy and then the North Dublin Union. Uh, and afterwards, by 1928, and it took that long for her as an anti-treaty woman to get a job, she got a job as a teacher uh, when she becomes active in the Irish National Teachers Organization, the INTO. She campaigns over many years for equal pay and status for women. Uh, teachers, one of her lifelong campaigns was to get the marriage bar for women teachers overturned, and this happens in 1957, finally. During the six months, uh, 1946, teacher strike, she served on the strike executive committee. She was then on the salaries and arbitration committee established in the aftermath. Her efforts were instrumental in securing a common incremental salary scales for men and single, for women and single men uh, in 1949. She was on the INTO central executive uh, for many years, then its vice president, and finally its president in 1956-57. On her retirement from teaching, she served uh, on the Irish Congress of Trade Unions, its first, uh, in, when it was established first, in the Executive uh, Committee. She was head of that and makes a speech uh, to that, bemoaning the lack of status of women. So this is a woman who sees the first wave of suffrage. Uh, in fact, she joined the WSPU in, in her native Glasgow and was a militant feminist there. She sees the beginning of second wave feminism uh, in Ireland in the uh, early, 90, or early 1960s uh, and is still fighting for the rights of women. Another revolutionary woman, suffrage and trade union activist, was Selina Maloney, who had noted bitterly in 1930 how, despite winning the vote, Irish women retained, and I quote, their inferior status, their low pay for equal work, their exclusion from juries and certain branches of the civil service, their slum dwellings and crowded, cold, unsanitary schools for their children. She continued, despite health challenges, to campaign for the rights of women and the rights of workers. She was active in several organisations in the first decades of the Irish Free State, including the Women's Prin Prisoners Defence League, the People's Rights Association and the Anti-Partition League. As the Irish Women Workers Union Organising Secretary from 1929 to 41, she was prominent in growing the membership of that union to over 5,000 members. A persistent fighter for the working class, she was elected president of the IT, uh, Irish Trade Unions Congress in 1937, the second woman to hold that office, and she remained working with the IWW until 1941 when she had to retire for health reasons. These few case studies show that many of the political and revolutionary women continued their activism on into the Irish Free State, despite pushback from the state. As the decade of centenaries ends with the commemorations of the Civil War, the inclusion of women is central. This, um, the importance of Cumann Amman's rejection of the treaty and its wholehearted participation on the anti-treaty side is reflected in the attitude of the newly formed state to these women it's our incarceration and mistreatment of hundreds of them, and it's construction of these militants as diehards, furies, unmanageable, ungovernable revolutionaries. And it reflects what was and would continue to be a deeply misogynistic attitude to women generally in the new state. Women's histories are difficult to encompass in this uh, commemorative settings, as there's often no one event, or indeed is there even now an end point, to the course of policing of female bodies that would continue on into the Irish Free State and the subsequent Irish Republic. Seeing commemoration in its broader sense, therefore, we can now incorporate new imaginings, uh, new counter-narratives to the revolutionary decade and the subsequent states, not forgetting Northern Ireland, of course, where the position of women wasn't much better, uh, which came into being on this island. There are not, these are not just possible, but required in order for us to get a f the fullest, broadest history. Inconvenient and overlooked female histories and experience of the revolutionary period and of the Irish Free State and the marginalisation of and violence, physical, institutional, systemic and structural done to women can no longer be seen as peripheral to our national or indeed our foundational narratives. They are central and need to be acknowledged as such. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you, Mary McAuliffe. Our final speaker of this panel is Dr. Joseph Brady of the UCD School of Geography, and his paper is A New Beginning, Dealing with Dublin's Housing Crisis in the 1920s. Morning, everyone. Um, the question mark after A New Beginning is the key to the paper, because the, the whole issue of the 20s was very much a case of what are we going to do? How are we going to solve this problem? I, I like as a way of giving you an image that I'd like you to carry with you as I speak is the image there, which is the frontispiece from uh, Patrick Abercrombie's um, Dublin of the Future, published in 1921 by Harry Clark. And it's called The Last Hour of the Night. And of course, it gives a very, very grim and dark picture of the city. But don't forget, the last hour of the night is the hour just before the dawn. So it is the idea that things are now going to get brighter. Now, the first thing to do is to put my hand up and say, I don't have precise data for 1922. Uh, there was a bit of a problem in 1921, as you know, and the taking of a census was probably a little bit too exciting. But there are good estimates from the 1911 census, from the 1913 housing inquiry, the 1918 North City survey, and the 1926 survey, uh, the census uh, completes the picture. So what is the challenge? Now, I am by no means suggesting that the challenge was limited to Dublin. I'm by no means suggesting that there was no problem elsewhere. It's just that Dublin was much worse than anywhere else. In fact, you would have to go very far within Ireland and indeed within the confines of the empire to find a city that had worse problems. The 1913 housing inquiry which was a very comprehensive inquiry, and Dublin Corporation felt that they were very hard done by in it, said that, quite simply, Dublin is a city of one-room tenements. There were 25,800 families in tenements, but you see that there were 25,000 living in one room. In 1918, Dublin Corporation undertook a detailed survey of the North City. Uh, they ran out of steam. They didn't do the survey of the South City. I think they just looked at it and said, oh, and they estimated that they needed 10,000 new dwellings for the north side alone, assuming that about 2,000 families could be kept in renovated tenements. Now, if you look at the map, if you look at these splodges of yellow on the map, those are where the tenements were. Notice that they are everywhere in the city centre. There are very few cities in Europe which where you have this measure of poverty so close to the main buildings of the city and indeed so close to the better off parts of the, the South City. As I say, the Dublin Corporation never got around to, to uh, going there. Two decisions added to the challenge. W.T. Cosgrave opposed tenement renovation. Now, if W.T. opposed it, it didn't happen. Because very simply, although he had his national responsibilities, he remained a corporation man all his life. And he continued to exercise a degree of influence, some would say control, over what went on. And the second was Dublin Corporation took the view that they were going to build well. That despite the challenge, they were going to build good houses. They were determined, absolutely, that they were not going to recreate slums. That goes through the whole process since they start doing this in 1885. And you might say they didn't do enough, and that's absolutely true. But they were conscious of the fact that we are going to build the best possible houses that we can. And five-roomed cottages, and the word is always used, it's a bit twee, but it's how it is referred to. They are referred to as cottages. Five rooms was about right. They were housing large families and that they, you needed the space. I mean, that's a three-bedroomed um, terraced house. Uh, not exactly palatial, but not small either. Money was the problem. They did their sums, and just to house the people on the north side, they were going to need £4.7 million in 1918, the figure, the key figure here is the average cost. The average cost is indicated at £470 in 1918. This was hopelessly optimistic by 1919. Post-war inflation in building costs was making housing unaffordable. Where have you heard that recently? 
And in fact, if you want to see a manifestation of that, go into Earls for Terrace and have a look at the back of what was UCD's Earls for, Earls for Terrace building. It's not finished. It was another project that had to go at the end of the time because it could not be afforded. Houses in Fairbrothers Fields were now coming in at £659. Dublin Corporation believed that the maximum rent it could charge at the time would be £24 a year versus an average cost of £47 a year. This was unsustainable. That gap was going to have to be met by somebody. And as Mary very cogently said to us, you can see that there weren't many somebodies out there who could actually fill the gap. So what about funding? Well, funding had been provided for social housing via soft loans, which came via the local government board. But this relationship had broken down in 1919 with the Fairbrothers Fields project, in essence, the local government board had said, don't do it, and Dublin Corporation had said, we will. They did this by going into the market, and they managed to raise enough money uh, by a, 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 a three and a quarter percent redeemable stock, and they went to, back to the market several times during the 1920s and raised money, but there were never going to be enough. So, something else was needed, and of course, the SARS thought was not going to be the place to give it except perhaps uh, you would just have to do it this way. Now, the solution that they put forward was as simple as it was unattainable. They were going to build as much social housing as possible at the lowest possible cost. They were going to leverage as much private savings as possible into house purchase. And that was going to reduce the pressure on the tenements with the result that the worst of them would be emptied and the heat would be taken out of the housing market. Well, you can see the idea. We get people into housing, we get other people using their savings to buy housing. That'll mean, that means that the tenements won't be as, as, as overflowing as they are. The worst of them will be taken out, the prices will drop, and people will still be in tenements, but they'll be in the better tenements. I know it's a stretch, but you can well understand how you might be going there given the financial circumstances that were earlier outlined. There was hope. The million pound grant. Now, this was announced by W.T. Cosgrave to Dublin Corporation on the 25th of January 1922. It came as a great surprise. In fact, the Irish Times was so surprised by it that you'll see the ad there, it says, one million pounds for house building in Dublin. It wasn't, it was one million pounds for house building in the state. But nonetheless, it was there. In fact, WT said, I, I'm not sure how it's going to work, he says, uh, but we know we're going to do it and we'll let you know in good time. In fact, it took until March of that year before the details of it were announced. That was extremely useful. Uh, Dublin Corporation got about a half a million pounds from it, but that was pretty well it. That was the last big input. So more creative solutions were needed. And this is where tenant purchase arrived on the scene. Now the idea had been developing for some time, but it came to fruition on that same day as the million pound grant was announced. The a significant portion of the working class were artisans. They had decent income, steady and good income. What they didn't have is that they didn't have our access to the market. They didn't have access to credit. And it was reckoned that they could afford their own houses. And so you get the statement which is there, which is, there's a lot of flannel in there, but it does have an important phrase. And that phrase will come back as I go through this. It says, the, the responsibility of ownership will naturally induce tenants to take a greater interest in the care of their dwellings, obviate the large, to a large extent the expenditure in repairs which the present conditions of tenancy involves, and it will consequently inspire amongst them a greater civic spirit. These are things that are important. But the main thing here is Dublin Corporation sees a way of being able to build without carrying the cost. 
So we can now move, we can build our good houses, we can, uh, we can build the ones we want to build, and we are going to start by offering them to our existing tenants. Um, they had built 1,172 cottages since 1898, uh, or 1893. Now, you might think, okay, that wasn't really great, was it? Um, but in the circumstances, it was a good start. And they were given a good deal. Uh, it involved a repayment period up to 60 years. But nobody, nobody took it up. Nobody at all took it up. They looked at it and they said, you must be joking. We will stick as we are. And it was quietly dropped. But the idea wasn't dropped. The tenant purchase idea was not dropped. And in fact, it becomes the universal policy for most of the housing of the 1920s. It was never universally popular. In fact, it was passed only with a narrow majority in Dublin Corporation. And the convenient abolition of Dublin Corporation in 1924 ensured that that question was never raised politically again. It was 1930 before this could be discussed again in any kind of formal discussion within the corporation. There were many voices during the 1920s to do away with it, but nonetheless it held for the decade and it produced very, very good housing. The the first primary scheme, the first major suburban scheme, and I know Fairbrothers Fields was built before, is Merino. And Merino is, I think, probably the best social housing scheme that this country has ever produced. Uh, <laughs> it was innovative in so many different ways, in terms of the amount of green space, the, the nature of the roads. In fact, the, the, road, the road scheme in Reno is what planners are now reintroducing elsewhere because it stops cars going through the place. Uh, the, the, the range of housing, uh, no single house type, uh, six different house types, all with the full range of facilities. There was a row earlier on about whether or not the working class needed a bath, but that was, that was, that was, that was sorted out very, very quickly. It was followed by um, Drumcondra, also with a very distinctive ge uh, geometric shape. That I have found no evidence, by the way, of the suggestion that some have made that these are deeply Kabbalistic uh, symbols and that, that they are all secret references to uh, various Catholic symbols of upturned chalices, candelabras, and Celtic crosses. But nonetheless, the geometric shape is very much part of the approach to town planning at the time. And the houses are fine houses. The, if you look at the range of housing that you find in Merino, it's not surprising that a hundred years later that they are still greatly in demand and that they have stood the test well. But as I said, it's not just, it's not just social housing that the state is interested in uh, supporting, and indeed Dublin Corporation is interested in supporting, because it is felt that anything that makes a dent in the demand, because private housing is also in short supply. There are, the argument, I go back to it, is that a lot of people living in the tenements could be in their own housing if they could get it. So one of the innovations of the time is the idea of a public utility society. Now, public utility societies first arrived in Dublin with the building of this, the St. Barnabas Public Utilities, Utility Society in East Wall, uh, under the aegis of the Reverend David Hall. Now, what's a public utility society? Effectively, it's a cooperative. It means that you know, all you guys get together. You pool your savings. You invite your friends to assist you by buying shares in this organization. The pool savings allow you to build a number of houses. These houses are occupied by members of the society. They start paying back their mortgage into the society. And bit by bit, everybody in the society gets a house. When, when it's done, the society dissolves. Both the state and Dublin Corporation recognise the value of this because you could leverage individual savings here in a way which couldn't otherwise be done. 
In other cases, private builders were given surface sites, they were given land swaps, there was, there was road building done, and Dublin Corporation encouraged utility societies to build in reserved areas. And reserved areas were a concept which they came upon by accident, whereby in their social housing schemes, they liked houses of a superior standard. Why? Coming back to the business of social values. It, it finished off the, 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 the uh, estate in a suitable way, and it inculcated the kind of values that people felt were important. You know, how do you keep your front garden? What kind of curtains do you put on the windows? This kind of thing. So much so that in the 1920s, you would say that the difference between public and private building is blurred. The difference between the public sector and the private sector is blurred. This is an example of a utility development on the edge of Merino. Merino is edged by public utility society building. How do you tell the difference? They're semi-detached. Within Merino, the standard is um, terraced. But here is the, the encouragement. This is a brochure from Dublin Housing Week, which took place in 1925. If you look at the names, you can see who's involved, and you see the Reverend D. H. Hall is there. But look at the figures. Public utility societies are given the same level of support as a local authority. So if you are a member of a utility society, you get an enhanced level of grant. The figure at the bottom, the figures at the bottom indicate, for example, it says thus, a person or a public utility society wishing to build a house at a cost of £600 can receive for a five-roomed house, in addition to reduced rates, the person, £75. The utility society, £100. The person from Dublin Corporation, £75. The utility society, £100. Together, the individual will need somewhere in the region of between 150 to 300 pounds to buy a house. If you're a member of a utility society, you're up 50 quid. It's a large sum of money and it makes a difference. So, how was it, the question mark? Well, that depends. There was little building in the city centre during the decade. The slums were largely untouched. Now, that was a problem, because as the decade went on, and going back to this question of social values, it can be understood that having homeowners was not just a desirable thing in terms of solving the housing crisis. It was also producing the kind of society which the state wanted. And there was a growing concern with communism. Some kind of revolutions are better than others. And they, there was great talk of red forts, that flats, the tenements were places in which the communist revolution would be developed and would spring forth. Homeowners tend not to be communists. <laughs> and you can see how the thing went to develop. So it was widely recognized that this was doing the best but not doing enough. Little was done directly for the poorest people. It was only that filtering process that was going to do anything. Change comes at the end of the 1920s. And there's a series of housing legislation between 1929 and 1932. And there's a move to slum clearance, and there's a switch to rental. And in fact, Dublin Corporation appoints its first housing architect, Herbert Sims, who. Uh, died tragically by suicide in 48, simply because he couldn't cope with the pressures of the work. Uh, I mean, it was an appalling indictment of how things, were, how things were going. What was done? 1920s to 1931, 4,284 dwellings under tenant purchase. These are the five-roomed houses. Central flat schemes, only 446. But look at the figures. Families in tenements of one room, 24,000, give or take. 
there had been 21,000. What's happening? The city is growing. The city is still growing, and it's still growing by in-migration. So it has been likened to trying to empty a bath by keeping the taps running. By 1938, even after the, the huge incentives of the 1930s, it is reckoned that still 22,000 dwellings are needed to remove the, just the unfit or overcrowded, not necessarily the ones that are, that are, are dilapidated. But why? Well, the interesting thing about it is that in the debates about the Housing Act, there is little or no argument between the two governments. It was one of those things on which they agreed. I mean, it was, it was, it's almost astonishing to read the, the, the debates in the House because you begin to wonder who's the government and who's the opposition as they complement each other and say, well, you know, it was okay, you did your best. You find the Minister for Local Government, uh, Mulcahy, in 1931, saying that the general circumstances of the time and the building costs were such that the government could not, without serious prejudice to its credit and its financial reputation, have risked putting any more amount into housing, particularly housing for the working classes, and more particularly housing for the poorly paid working classes. And then the following year, uh, Sean T. O'Kealig, who has replaced him, says, it, it wasn't your fault, lads. He says, the problem arose because of British administration and from hereditary and economic causes arising out of foreign domination. <laughs> so, that's... And what's the way forward? Well, it speaks to my two colleagues again, is that... Um, he said, fine, the government will make a contribution, the maximum contribution permissible, so long as they are satisfied that the houses are let to the most needy applicants and that the rents charged are not unnecessarily low. There is this balance to be achieved at this stage. We will build. We will put a great deal of money into building, but you're not going to get it for nothing. You're going to have to show that you can afford this and this is going to have to be policed and supervised. Tenants must be selected with strict regard to income of family, size of family, and nature of existing accommodation. The payment of subsidy will be conditional on these matters being carefully attended to by each local authority. And if any case be found in which the spirit of the bill is not honoured, I will not hesitate to stop the subsidy in this regard. So it is certainly not going to be utopia, and it is certainly not going to be cheap. However, much was done in the 1930s. This is the era where we see the transformation of the city centre. Um, the, on the left-hand side, you see the Hanover Street flat developments of the 1930s, uh, built by Herbert Sims. On the right-hand side, there they are five years ago. They've come to the end of their useful life. Um, the, the question now is, it's a burning question, is whether or not we retain Sims's legacy in terms of the, the buildings he has produced and renovate at enormous cost and enormous time, or whether or not we say thank you and let them go. But on the, the bottom right-hand side, you see another example of the design of the times. This is Mercer House, close to St. Stephen's Green, the, the, the upper one are based on a Dutch design, the ones below are based on London County Council design. We sought the best, and we attempted to do the best, uh, and we looked for the best that was available at the time. We also went, we also scaled up. We, we, the, the suburban developments of the 1930s were not as diverse as Marino. Design was sacrificed for quantity, but scale. People are building 4,000, Dublin Corporation is building 4,000 houses a year. Now, 4,000 houses a year, if you said that nowadays, wouldn't they, people look at you and say, You're t are you talking for the country or are you talking for the decade? I mean, if, 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 it's, if you look at the right hand, uh, the diagram on the left hand side, uh, it's from the Crampton Building Company, uh, who are building one of the sections, and you see the development going ahead in months. 
you know, the 3rd of November, this section complete. The 17th of November, this section complete. All it designed to get this rapid increase in, into the housing and the building of the significant suburbs of places like Crumlin and Drimna. They, as I say, they sacrificed design and they also sacrificed size. I began this by saying that Dublin Corporation had decided in 1919 that it would build only five-roomed houses. By the time it's building in the 1930s, it's back to four, it's back to three. The unfortunate thing is that although places like uh, Drimna and Crumlin had replaced the worst of the slums, they were already overcrowded by the definitions in use by the various authorities at the time that they were built. So you would have to say that the tackling of the housing crisis, which began in the 1920s, certainly produced a dramatic impact on the problem, but it did not solve it. And of course, it hasn't been solved yet. And on that positive note, I will end. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Joe, and I'll invite you to join the rest of our panellists here. Um, we are just slightly over time, so I'm going to do a curtailed question and answer session. There's coffee and tea waiting outside, um, so we can continue the conversation there. Uh, a question for Mary McAuliffe. Is it true that Margaret Skinner was refused a military pension because she was a woman and the government defined soldier as male? Uh, and a question for Mary Daly. Given money shortages, existing poverty, impact of wars, etc., could the new state have afforded to entangle angle from the church, even if it had wanted to. So I might take those two first. Uh, with Margaret Skinner, of course, like everything else, it's a complicated answer. Yes, that's the reason they did give in the official letter to uh, Margaret Skinner. Um, but uh, W.T. Cosgrave had decided that uh, no anti-treaty person would get the, the pension uh, in, in the 1920s, in that iteration of the pension. And um, she had actually applied for the pension to see what they would do. So she's testing them and they are responding in the way that, that she expected. Of course, Bridget Lyons Thornton does get the pension, the only woman who does get it, but she had been pro-treaty. And, uh, and actually, I think has been commemorated this year as the first mm. woman officer in, in the uh, National yeah. Army. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yes, it's, it's, um, they said it was because she was a, a woman, but it's really because she was anti-treaty. Plus she applied as a member of the Irish Citizen Army because coming on were not allowed to apply, yeah. apply then. Okay. And Mary? Well, I mean, I can give you a one word answer if you like, and the answer is no. I think the other point I would like to make, however, is that this is not unique to Ireland. If you look at who's providing for all kinds of groups in need in Britain, in Germany, Italy, France, you know, uh, wherever you name Sweden, hmm. uh, a denominally based charities were central everywhere, in the States as well, to particularly not to you know, less to kind of the, the major acute hospital, if you like, or something like that. But once you get into categories of long-term illness, disability, uh, children in need of care, it, most of that was devolved almost everywhere to non-state non actors. They may have got some subsidy, but it was devolved. So we're not that unique in that regard. Okay, thanks, Mary. And Joe, a question that was asked about housing and welfare, but I wonder, would we maybe flip this into a question, sorry, about health and welfare, but we might flip it into a question about housing. Given the severe financial constraints on the new state and the many areas that were in need of fair uh, approaches to them, uh, could it be say that the questioner says health and welfare could be seen as parsimonious, but is, is housing maybe one of the areas where the state is actually pump priming a little bit or, or how would you describe their fiscal commitment I think, to it? I think parsimonious is probably a tough word because it suggests that there is more money available than was being mm -hmm. used. Mm -hmm. And I reckon mm -hmm. that they were using as much of the resources as they could. But certainly if you take Mary's paper and compare it to what I said, housing is certainly doing better. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it is doing better for all kinds of reasons, I think. I think you need to go back into the 19th century mm -hmm. and see the questions of there are issues of public health yeah. associated yeah. with the whole mm -hmm. question yeah. Yeah. of good housing. Yeah. Uh, and the very fact that the 
the genesis of the housing program in Irish cities and cities of the UK comes from, through the public health legislation and it's the appointments of medical officers of health mm. that do it and I reckon that that gives it an extra impetus. Does, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Plus the other fact then you have the question of the societal benefits of having homeowners, which becomes more acute during the 1920s. Yeah, but also if you're going to improve health at the time, uh, there's something you can do about infectious disease. But the, the, the best thing you can do to improve health is it's better true. housing and, and running water. Yeah, exactly. And it just shows how the, the three are interlinked in terms of healthcare and housing, but also then we saw in terms of mm. counter-revolutionary sentiment mm. and the housing question, incredible to think that flats are bastions of communism and that this is one of the oh, state oh, yeah. policies on it, so yeah. The Irish Times writes in 1953 still <laughs> saying that if uh, communism ever gains a foothold in oh. this country, it will be, be because these flat blocks continue to exist. <laughs> okay. So it still <laughs> runs through. <laughs> okay. Social conservatism, housing, health They're and not. gender. You've heard it all here. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to uh, close this panel now as we are just slightly over time. I'm going to make an executive decision and move the breaks. If you can start coming back in here around 20 past. And for those looking on the live stream, the next session will commence at 25 past 11. There is tea and coffee outside. And also our next panel is in Irish. So if you want to listen online, there is a second feed, which will have simultaneous translation in English. And there are headsets outside for our guests here in the room. Thank you very much. We'll reconvene around 20 past. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Hannah. Thank you. Well done. Okay, thank you, you thank you very much. Um, so we just have, we have to get accustomed to the, the technologies. The technology is wonderful. Um, it's, it's great, an honour to myself. I'm very happy to present the second panel on the Irish language structure, official structures and communities in the in, in publish on the question of state to today. I'm very happy that we have three excellent speakers here today who've great experience and great uh, expertise in this the subjects prevent us before us today. And I hope that there will be uh, um, many, many topics will arise from this. The people here who don't have fluent Irish perhaps, I know that the earphones are available and there are interpreters up there and they have done wonderful work throughout this conference to make sure that everybody has access to, to everything that's been discussed here. Just, um, Our interpreters are there with the, and the earphones are available. Uh, and, and as well as I'd just like to inform you also in the con context of Sligo, Sligo and the questions which Connor mentioned earlier this morning, that if you scan the QR code there that's in the programme, that you will get into the questions and that you can then uh, put uh, ask questions via Slido, like in the other previous sessions, and I'll get them there. Please feel free to put your question in English. Uh, we will take all questions and be delighted to have them. So um, I, I know I understand that everybody here uh, is not uh, speaking Irish and we very much welcome uh, everyone's opinions on what will be said today. So please do put your questions in English if you prefer. Uh, so Thank you very much for, for that. And we'll start, uh, I know, with the, the time. The time is passing. So just to a few a few uh, phrases, just a few things, a few things that Orla said yesterday for instance, in the context of the, the age of this country and the the FI for that's a vision and AOIS age. Uh, so I think that's about thinking about the vision of the Irish language. But one of the things that she mentioned was that the vision of the revival and the vision of the state in the context of the heritage of the Irish language in this country. But the other thing she mentioned as well was that the age of the country, it's a very young country, we're a very young country. And in the context of that, that we are just, we're just coming to fruition, we're coming to maturity, we're, we're getting finding our feet and if we look at what has been achieved over the past hundred years, it's a wonderful uh, uh, matter, particularly in terms of the Irish language and particularly in terms of everything that has been achieved. Certainly, in terms of Joe mentioned this morning, uh, nothing is perfect and we are dealing with problems uh, all the time, but nevertheless, there's a lot of things that are happening that are pro progressing at a very high level. And the second thing then there is what Mara said this this morning about a hundred years and about over the all hundred years. One of the best things that has happened is the way in which the state is still uh, being, being run and it's still working uh, to a, a, a destination. That's what Professor Sean O'Thoma said about the revival of the Irish language before. That what he said was that really was that the revival of the Irish language was one of the the biggest events 
and the most democratic events that took place that that, that was established ever, but but uh, but it is not always recognised as thus. So, like the foundation of the state, the same thing perhaps with the the rival of the Irish language. But we are in a new era now, and before us now, the first speaker this morning, this afternoon, will be a professor, uh, Cahill Gorm. He's from Bel Belfast, Cahill, uh, natively, and he achieved his um, degree in Celtic studies in his university. As well as that, he's also spent peri periods in RT, of course, and also uh, he, he was the first uh, head of TG Cahad in 1994, and he was uh, uh, was nominated as the, the Director General of RT, uh, a job which he had for seven years, and he will be. Uh, I, I will say that the, 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 the title of the talks as they come up, um, Dr. Reno Kongongail of the School of Celtic Studies and Folklore is the second speaker we will have this morning, Associate Professor in the School of Celtic Studies. He has a particular interest in the revival of the Irish language and in particular the, the media history and in particular uh, youth affairs. She was uh, bestowed with a grant, uh, um, a degree for her and her principal research area is of the participation of young people in terms of European language which is from 1990 to 2020, which is um, um Finance, financed by European re Research Fund. If you want to find that, you will find it Y-E-E-L-P on the site. And the third speaker we have then is Dr. Padraig Brandon O'Ryan from the Department of Sociology in UCD. And he has qualifications MA and PhD in Sociology. Um, and he's, a, a, he's also a lecturer in McGill University in Canada and in Montreal also in uh, for many years, he taught um, postgraduate courses in social linguistics in Ireland also, and he was he was also a representative in Ireland on the the, server, sur, the social service survey program international, and he was a member also of the international staff that developed the module and the questionnaire under the uh, national competency. He has a central role in the com campaign to get some bits for Irish as official language in the European Union as a working language in the institutes of the European Union, and. Also, the Irish language community, community population, institute, institute status, and power is the book. He the most latest book he's written, and it's just been published uh, uh, in 2022. And I'd like to congratulate on, on that, Padraig. But we'll start now with um, with uh, Professor Cahill Gorn, and the title uh, his, of his um, talk uh, is Cahill's is identity, vision, and responsibility. So I leave it to Cahill. Thank you very much, Regina. Uh, I'm, I'm very honoured to be here today to participate in this conference, and I, I hope that, that, that this panel uh, will cast extra light on some of the questions that relate um, closely to the establishment of the state. Um, just a, a personal reminder, perhaps, about what I have to say uh, about another as a one aspect of this, this story is that this, the role of women and the development of, 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 of in terms of the uh, foundation of the state. Part of the power paradox relating with the question, question of the Irish language early in the period that we're talking about, that it was through the medium of English that was mostly discussed, the crisis uh, from the first um, speech of Douglas Hyde in 1892 uh, onwards. Um, if there was a transfer of language from, from Irish to English in the period before that, it was, un was unavoidable as a result of the various powers in the state and, and, and the church, as is often claimed. It's certain that there was uh, this sped up. Um, had was a, a, a cause of concern for the people preserving the language and for the students and the literature in particular. There were various groups who recognised the, the heritage of the Irish language as a source of inspiration, uh, as a, a, a source of, 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 of creative as a, in under prestige language. Therefore, um, uh, 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 it was a continuous pattern that we do in English that many many of the editor, editor, uh, the editorials were written in Irish of Enclave Solish, the magazine of Conan O'Gaelge from the turn of the century up to 1918. With the change of the title to Fine and Lay, there was a change in emphasis in the editorials and the priority of the Irish language uh, as been shown ably by the chairperson is here, uh, Professor Regina Eichel-Latine. 
It was often emphasized on the importance of the language in the education system, as well as the internal role of the league, the delegates that are the talked, and also was a commentary uh, about uh, belief of, of religion and politics and their standing, their relations in terms of the Irish language. By by the year 20, 1919, Pierce put this framework uh, on the uh, on the Gaelic League. Uh, on on the pages of this, uh, what is, is the work that we have that, that was put before 20 years ago to protect the Irish language from from death? Yes, but why why would we do so? So that Ireland would live as we understood it. Uh, that Irish is not Irish would Ireland would not be Ireland without the Irish language. If there was if it was a clear, just clear message was was made there that it was an integral part of the Irish language of the national that was being imagined. Two two uh, years after that, there was no reference at all in the proclamation. Uh, apart from the title Irish Republic, the Heron Irish Republic, even though the, the League and the Cleve Solish were free from political bias, if, if so, nevertheless, uh, it gave uh, an unquestioning uh, uh, platform for Eamon de Valera in the edition of, of 1917. It was a puff piece, as it would, might be called nowadays. The questioners were asked, was there, do you have any advice for the Gaelic League? Uh, there are two things required, he said, as a nation. We need education and we need a proper uh, uh, private opportunities. We have to get people into, into organisations and we have to have um, education. The, the League should have provided the foundations for education. Sinn Féin, Sinn Féiners can great, great, and aid the League. We can, we can attract the school managers towards the Irish language. Every person who does, who is elected in his own area should, should have Irish. Should, should take on its responsibility of, of promoting Irish. But Irish was not limited to the Irish language magazines only. As well as discussing in English about the, the, the area of the language, there were bits in Irish, in, in English language papers also, as reports also, uh, about uh, court cases in which Irish was a cause of, of, of dispute. Early in 1919, the Freeman's Journal reported in English of a, of a, of a, a court case in Tipperary in which Cahill Brew was convicted because he refused to use the English version of his name to the RIC. The week after that, there was an, an announcement, but this bilingual announcement was in the same uh, newspaper. And you, you will notice here uh, that it says the following has been supplied as if it's, it's indicating that there was no other choice but to, um, to publish this announcement. And uh, uh, you will notice there also, uh, between brackets there, it's a translation. And then uh, I think for the benefit of the censor, uh, perhaps uh, that might have been inserted. But this is an announcement that was saying that the first dial will be coming to meeting up uh, in the week, the following week. And the following day, uh, of, uh, in the front from the 18th uh, of, the, the, the sensitivity of the Irish speakers was reflected in another bilingual report on the same new newspaper about a meeting that took place the day before in the Lord Mayor's residence, where Sean T. O'Kella, Padre Gamala, Liam de Roche and Pierce Basley were appointed as members to provide Irish language terms for the, for the dial. And then it was said in English only. It was unanimously decided that no English translation of the report of the meeting be supplied to the papers as they failed to publish the Irish version of the report of the last meeting which was sent to them. Uh, that's not the first time, and will certainly not be the last time, that the Irish language community have expressed their dissatisfaction with the behaviour and attitude of the English language media, media towards it. They could be accused of wanting too much that it was not realistic to expect such a complete change in language uh, behaviour. A foreshadowing, perhaps, of what was to come in the next hundred years. When the first dial was held the following week, the Cleve Solish announced on the front front page, or final lay, as called the time, of the nation of nations of the world, the nation of Ireland has proclaimed its independence, its elected members have been elected, having met in the country's capital, on the 21st day of J January 1919. On page four of the Freeman's Journal, a report was given in Irish on the first day of the Dáil. And, and, and that's, that's on page four. And in English, a more comprehensive description on the front page. There was a positive pre pressment in Enclave on the 8th of February, a few weeks before that.
We said two weeks ago that Dáil Éireann could do a lot to promote the Irish language. The Dáil has made a good start. All of the deputies spoke nothing but Irish during the First Assembly. If that was a good start, according to the writers from Cleve, the opposite opinion was read in the Daily Express. It is difficult to believe the public will continue to take an absorbing interest in the tame proceedings conducted in dull fashion, in a language that most people do not understand and with which only a comparative handful are expertly familiar. Now, uh, contemptuous as that assessment is, and as tone deaf as the person who wrote it is, in relation to the sentiment of the majority of the public towards the dial and perhaps the language, there was a bitter amount of the truth in that the majority of the people of the country did not understand the Irish language. The use of Irish as a symbol of independence was more of a message aimed at the British Empire than a heartfelt and con con conscientious attempt to speak to the Irish people themselves. And after that, if the delegates were showing hope for what could be achieved in the new state and reaffirming Ireland's distinctiveness as a special place with a special language, that message was not clear even to themselves. If the people who voted for them didn't understand what some of the deputies were saying, it, may, it was as well to admit that a lot of the people themselves didn't understand it either. To address that paradox, I think, Piers Beasley proposed a resolution about a translation system in the Dáil in April. In accordance with notice, P. Beasley, East Kerry, and moved and T. Maxine Midcork seconded that an official interpreter be appointed to translate Irish English speeches at the private meetings of the Dáil when necessary. Close quote. Cahill Brew, Waterford, moved an amendment as follows, which was seconded by P.O. Moyle Connemara, that deputies be free to use whichever they prefer and that no interpreter be appointed until it is established there is a need for his services. The amended re resolution was adopted. It, the meaning of those events is difficult to understand from today's perspective. You would think that the original proposal was only a constructive resolution that would enable all the delegates to participate in the debates, regardless of what language was being spoken. Was it that deputies were reluctant to admit that some of the an analysis in the Express a few months earlier was correct, and that a translation service was needed? Was it not possible for the dial to find or pay for interpreters? Or perhaps the delegates had already understood that future debates would be held mainly in English, and and a, and a cordial interpretation service was not needed. In any case, language affairs were involved when Prime Minister Eamon de Valera gave his first speech to the Dáil on April 10th about the purpose and direction of the Cabinet. He spoke in Irish and English, but he did not refer in any clear way, and it's particularly in the debate that followed, the delegates spoke only in Irish, and some of the speakers particularly interested in the situation of the language. Here's what Pierce Basley said. As for the language, I am told that it is in no danger. Most of the deputies here are knowledgeable in Irish, and hardly any of them do not know some Irish, but nevertheless, I am not satisfied that it is not in danger, and we must do our utmost, lest they should be found wanting. I know the Prime Minister will not be find, found wanting. We have a bilingual cabinet and a bilingual dial, and it should receive fair and equal treatment from all. Hardly anyone would oppose the basic principle of getting justice and fair, fairness from all. And certainly the majority of the delegates recognised that it was in great da danger as a daily spoken language. But there was a big gap between that and its general acceptance that all deputies and indeed the majority of the community were yet competent to speak or understand it. It is with great regret that I must confess that I am not competent to address you in the Irish language, said Mr Macdonough from North Tipperary in another debate that evening. 
though numerous were the uh, how many about to publish it even though though there were many was uh, how many of them who were happy to the, the, of the to take up the motto of Clive Southers to turn it into reality into their own personal in terms of language um, conduct I cannot say or even predict how big how greatly the deputies took on the personal challenge for themselves uh, of, of acquiring the language it was a, a tool of propaganda using the language of the oil uh, not uh, evidence of a lingua franca if the criteria is the debates even in the oil are any guide I'm not here to argue that it could be the other way around there's no doubt that the likes of Baisley and many other deputies were committed to the cause of the language. But that wasn't everybody's story. There's no evidence that there was op opposition to the vision uh, 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 on the establishment of the new state, and it was more often the opposite. And because it, it was somebody else's responsibility to take over this. This, this wasn't the responsibility of the individual deputy uh, because because there were other challenges that they had to overcome in these days. The following day, on the 50, 11th of April, it, the proceedings of the Assembly were entirely in English. But in the same debate, Pierce Paisley sp uh, spoke and Cahal Brewer said, uh, regarding the Irish language in Irish, he said, from now on the Irish language must be taught to every child in Ireland. We will consult with the Gaelic League about this. We will have a minister in charge of education, and he will consult with the business committee regarding matters of language education and language and education. But as as, as would be, be Beasley, there could be no doubting Bruce's commitment on this issue. But it was not clear if there was any deep thought had been put in in support of this ambitious resolution. It, 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 it's also worth noting that Conor had a, had an influence in shaping the pol education policy of the country. But when this came to, to, to pass a few years later, with, with the establishment of the Free State, uh, it, it, it was l l clear that there was a fatal combination of innocence and arrogance relating to the transfer of responsibility for language behaviour to teachers who are not properly trained and who are often reluctant and cynical as a result as a result, no matter how loyal to the new state they were. There was, it, it could also be argued that there was naivety and idealism to, to be seen in the founder of the revival movement, Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Douglas Hyde, when he made an, an evangelical start to the new service on a wireless service on the first day of January 1926. The requiring of the language was to be part of the task of this service as uh, 2RN, as well as a task for the teachers of the country. There was only limited acceptance in terms of transmission to, of this service, which did not reach Gaeltic areas, as far as I know, in the early days. As well as that, uh, there were a very small number of radio devices available to listen to the service. In, in that context, it's not surprising that most of Hyde's speech was in Irish. This is some of what he said. The time is coming soon when a young man without Irish cannot say that he is not only a Gael but an Irishman. But, but, uh, but on the other side of the border, uh, perhaps, that the language of his ancestor would not be his. And uh, wherever the person is in the world, the, the Irish people will meet each other and will recognise each other and in the tongue of each other and they'll say, God bless you and, and God bless you. Uh, 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 a fellow Irishman from Ireland. The government was aware of, in advance of what Creven would have said, but 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 paid little attention to the new medium and its message. And it said Irish sp uh, broadcasting spent its early years under the worst possible auspices, a department that didn't want control of it, a parliamentary secretary, Heffernan, a farmer's man, whose sole concern was to cut government demands on the farming community, and a minister who also happened to be, at the time, uh, Minister of the Economy uh, Conscious, de of the Economy Conscious Department of Finance, Ernest de Blyde. This was, this was the opinion of Leon O'Brien. 
uh, as well as the many other faults that the new service had, it, it, there, was, there was too much attention was given to, to the um, life of the Irish language and the, and the Gaeltacht. Uh, if that was true, and on the contrary, um, not providing a proper service in Irish speak, and it was not providing a proper service, this tension and contrast continued for years. It, 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 it was clear that the Cumberland Gael government and the Fianna Fáil regime after them realised that there was a need to act on the various obstacles related to the preserve, preservation of the Gaeltacht and, and was declining and on the one hand and on the other hand uh, aware of the numerous obstacles that rose up against the policy of Irish in the public service and in the education system. In the numerous, in the num number of reports, commissions, and councils that were instituted over the years, it, it, it was a testament to their dedication that none of them were reluctant to consistently demonstrate their commitment to this vision. But there were different priorities, wh which were wh which were constantly struggling against each other, and and it and there was hardly a vision about the nationalisation or renationalisation re of the country, no matter how abstract it was a vision which was hardly at the top of any list. It was a task for some other dream. This was the understanding that Tom Sergerig, the Minister for Education, to Eamon de Vlera, President of the General Council, in September 1937, when proposals were being considered for the promotion of the Irish language in the public service. Uh, and, and there's a lot of frustration to be noted in this. He wrote it in, in English. He says, he says, because I feel very strongly that if the Executive Council are really interested in the language question, it is high time that the ministers themselves should take the matter in hand. It's, it's, it's that way to this day. There's no doubt that the government, after governments, have given continuous and significant support to various aspects of Irish as a community spoken language, as a school curriculum subject, and as a printed and broadcast medium, in international comparative terms, various governments, various government initiatives have helped to effectively slow down the decline of the language against the English mainstream. The two largest and most visible government initiatives in half a century are based are media-based initiatives. As a result of a protest, RT Radio Nagelsic was established in 1972 and TG Cahir in 1996. Services that are successful but the same tensions about who they are aimed at are still a matter of disagreement. The team of responsibility uh, was analysed by Taigo Hifrenan about TG Cahir in the year 2000. It was, it was perceived by the press and probably a greater part of the population as embodying the state's commitment to the language, while simultaneously absolving the government from making any further major commitment to language issues. And so, the channel came on air to provide an uh, uh, answer uh, Irish speakers and found themselves saddled with additional responsibility of catching and fading the torch of language revival and a tired, arthritic hand of the state. O'Hifferman uh, 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 thought that the establishment of the service was proof of a new policy of compartmentalising Irish as a minority issue. If that's true, it was a sense. It was a sensational, non-published policy. There's enough evidence that wh wh what he said had something. Um, the the act of. Uh, uh, it, it's clear in a multilingual country that this was an adequate policy, and it's clear there was substance in what he said. The, 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 the act of kneeling before the altar of the Irish is usually done at major state occasions, but it becomes inconspicuous in the national discourse through the medium of English language. Um, and that's been the, the case for uh, um, 50 years. Uh, and it is is it's clear that uh, um, uh, it, it, it's heartfelt as I welcome this particular panel through the medium of Irish at this Congress. And, and I noted this, talking, this panel is talking about the Irish language. And there, there's no other aspect of our, our history that can be discussed through the particular mediums. Is the medium the message? Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Carl. There are quite a number of questions coming in on Slido, and if we're going to have our, a, a second speaker, uh, uh, Dr. Reen Nikongal, Nikongal, and she's talking about the strengthening of, of the strengthening the national fibre, uh, the Irish and free state education system. I'm just going to get the slides together now. No, that's fantastic. Uh, hello, everybody, and I'm delighted to get this invitation. I'm going to be talking in Irish about the, uh, the issue of the Irish language, just like uh, Carl did. Um, 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 Carl mentioned the speech in, in, in 1919 and that Ireland should be taught to every pupil in Ireland. And I'll be directing myself, uh, I'll be directing my, my speech on, uh, talk onto that as well. In 1922, there's a big difference between the state of the Irish in the Free State and the state of Irish in Northern Ireland. In the, in the Seer State, it seemed that the vision of the Conor Gaelga would be realised with the use of language expanding in the education system from national schools to the universities. Irish was a core subject in the new education system, and there were almost 500,000 students in the national schools supposedly learning the language of school. And, and uh, supposedly so, in any way, the government wanted to strengthen and raise the sound of the Irish language in the country through the education system, and to that end, the Department of Education had many practical tax, tasks. The department had a duty to ensure that all teachers had enough Irish to teach the language to children, that inspectors with Irish uh, ha were to be appointed, and a decision had to be made regarding the teaching methodologies that could be used. Curricula were to be set, school books were to be written, state examinations to be held in the context of the secondary schools, etc. In Northern Ireland, the vision of the Gaelic League failed, and the Irish language was marginalised in the education system. As an example, between 1924 and 27, the number of national schools that taught Irish as an optional subject decreased by 50%, with only 78 national schools teaching it by 1927. That marginalisation was a severe blow to Irish speakers in the north, and it was planned to set up a new organisation, Coltus Ulli, in 1926 in order to protect the marginal place of Irish in the education system and to develop the language through cultural networks outside the system of education. This talk will focus on the status of the Irish language in the Free State and Northern Ireland in the 1920s and the challenges of teaching the language in both educational systems. In February 1922, a month before Irish was accepted as a core subject in the new education system, the Chief Officer of National Education, Patrick Bradley, informed the Board of National Education that they were all, uh, and they were all men. This is what he said. He said, in the administration of Irish education, it's the intention of the new government to work with all with its might to strengthen the national fight by giving the language, history, music and tradition of Ireland their natural place in the life of Irish schools. He mentioned the great and many-sided works of rebuilding which lies in it before us. He, he clearly said that out the priorities and path of the Department of Education, if, if, if Irish language and culture were harmed through the education system implemented by the English government, the new Department of Education was ready to rebuild the language and the culture. That work would begin in the national schools for the reason that all the young people in the country attended the national school and only approximately 23,000 pupils attended secondary schools in the Free State in the 1920s, and much than, less than that attended university. In 1921, the National, Irish National Teachers' Organisation, INTO, organised a conference of the first national programme. The, a, a, a report emerged from the conference that was a report was the cornerstone of the new national curriculum. As a result, Irish was accepted as a compulsory subject for one hour every day, in every class, in every national school, from the 17th of February 1922 onwards. The report recommended that subjects such as drawing, elementary science, hygiene, nature studies and needlework, for lower standards, be abolished as compulsory subjects. The same report said the subject-centred ideology, which reversed the child-centred ideology of the revised syllabus of 1900. 
Of course, a subject-centred approach was in place in the education system before 1900, but Irish was a marginal had a marginal subject in was a marginal subject in that system. From January 1922, Fionnuala Lynch was in the role of Minister for Education in the Provisional Government, focusing on the national schools, and Michael Hayes was Minister for Education with Dáileáin, focusing on second and third level. But from August 1922 to 1925, Owen McNeill was the first Minister of Education in a free state. The long-term development of the Irish language and the education system was therefore under the care of McNeill. And the first task before him was to ensure that the teachers in the national schools had enough Irish to teach it to the students of the country. McNeill had, old, had long experience of that kind of work. He was one of the people who went to Inish Mian to learn Irish in the last years of the 19th century. And he supported the early summer colleges that were set up to teach Irish to teachers out, outside the education system. In, in, in 1910, he was on the teaching staff at the summer college in Tormacady, County Mayo in 1912. He was appointed presser at Colossia Brida in Omid in County Loud. Therefore, he was directly involved with the summer colleges and with the Gaeltacht communities. The first summer college was set up in 1904, and they flourished from then on. By 1921, over a thousand people were attending the summer colleges every year. Uh, they fo uh, focused on teachers primarily, even though teachers were not required to learn Irish in the years of the of the revival. One can say, therefore, that there was a teaching program um, in, in, the, in the language uh, on 1922. Um, um, the, the, when they uh, to attend uh, uh, summer colleges um, in the summer to give the opportunity to them. In 1924 and 25, there was compulsory attendance for teach national school teachers under 25 years of age. But in 1926, it was a voluntary once again. Even though many of the teachers got a, a qualification, the number of teachers who didn't achieve the, the suitable um, in spite of the immersion education that was provided um, by the 1940s, for instance, a, 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 a cert was required um, in the regarding the teachers. Um, a, a particular course provided for those who, who wanted to teach various teachers to Irish. So just what you can see there uh, is the colleges um, who had uh, with the Department of Education. And if you see that as well about the various certs, so the people up there who didn't have Irish, a very good Irish, they did the ordinary certificate and the people who had our excellent Irish, they did the higher certificates or three levels there. So, but it's, it's the certificates. If the Irish language to flourish through the education system, it was necessary to promote the language in the, in the training colleges for teacher sub subjects. For uh, so the, the, the teacher for for our, um, trainee teachers, as John Coulihan points out, and I go back to John Coulihan all the time. Very quickly, Irish was declared a compulsory subject for entry in the training colleges. He I also said Irish was to be the medium of instruction and of social life within the training colleges. The, le the lectures were given through the medium of Irish in the training colleges, but there were no Irish language books available which related to the study of education. Also, uh, Nola C. Johnson has noted that there was a clear geographical bias in recruiting native speakers from the Gaeltacht as teachers in the national schools. If many teachers had good Irish, the next question they faced was that of teaching methodologies, the most effective ways to teach a language to school students. A particular teaching methodology, the, the, the direct method, was used in the summer colleges. And many educators, Padraig MacPierce among them, he, until he, he died, imagined that this was the best and most modern me methodology, although Owen MacNeill himself did not agree with that and his, in, his interest in the spoken method. That's another methodology. By 1922, there was no question but that the direct me method would be adopted as the method of teaching Irish in the national schools. But as the scholar Martin McCafferty has pointed out, educators were confused about the direct method. And as a result, it is very difficult to satisfactorily describe the teaching that teaching methodology. Some they didn't understand how, how would the children understand if they didn't teach Some of the Irish newspaper magazines, such as Mishnach and Toltoch, started to set up a separate column for teachers, in which teaching methods were discussed and explained, as well as parts of Irish grammar. But there was more than grammar that concerned the Irish language community. 
the pronunciation and spelling of Irish, the Gaelic font and, and the Roman font, and indeed uh, dialectical, dialectical issues were often discussed, as well as how teachers tackled those questions in the classroom. There was also a need for Irish reading material, and the number of children who could read Irish had increased dramatically. Irish literature for children had developed greatly as a result. This increase can be recognised through the work of the famous writer Padraig O'Connor, who started out writing for uh, adults and who was criticised by young readers, but he turned towards the young reader market in the 1920s. So we can see a few uh, books there from him there from 1920s onwards, but from 1923 up there he started to publish uh, for the mark for young readers because the books were required at the time. The education publishers such as Kaldach Irachish Neherin, Miguel and Sons, Monson and Roberts produced many books written by various men, including Michal Maclemo, Tumang Glastobin and Padre Miguel Ichara. Although the government of the Free State set up the GOOM in 1926, that's a publishing company of the Free State, for the purpose of publishing Irish language literature, material for young people was not published until the beginning of the 1930s. As mentioned by Ola Nihirinan, the young readers were marginalised within the major national and cultural initiatives. By the mid-1930s, according to the report of the Department of Education, there are very few school, schools now without a good, full collection of Irish books. And it was revealed in, in the report of the same report that the schools were gradually setting up their own libraries. There were particular difficulties in the education system in the, in the Gaeltacht day, and attention was paid to these difficulties when the Free State Government set up the Gaeltacht Commission in 1925. According to the Commission's report, the only type of education available to the Irish-speaking child is primary education, and broadly speaking, the education he gets leads nowhere except to emigration or to unskilled drudgery at home. It was pointed out that the educational facilities were deficient and unsuitable in many national schools. Irish language te textbooks could not be could not be compared with English textbooks. The schoolhouses were, were small, depressing, in bad repair, unsanitary, and poorly equipped with desks and seats. And teachers often did not have enough Irish to teach the language to the young native speakers in front of them. The Gwynedd Commission acknowledged the hunger suffered by young native speakers, especially in the West. Hunger in the West had been an, an old story, an old problem, which, which Roger Casement had, had, had addressed several years before, as you can see there in the appeal to the Irish school for the Irish school children of Connemara. The commission, the, the, the commission recommended that school means be provided daily available to all students attending a national school in the Gaeltacht. After much lobbying, the government implemented the School Meals Gaeltacht Act of 1930. By 1932, pupils attending 310 national schools were receiving a free school meal, a meal of milk or cocoa, mostly with bread and butter or jam. The School Meals Act ensured that the poor children of the Gaeltacht would not be as hungry, and it ensured that the same children would not depend entirely on charity or philanthropy alone, as, as had happened during the revival period. The Free State Government set up a scheme for the gifted young people of the Gaeltacht in order to improve the standard of Irish in national schools. Preparatory colleges for both um, genders were set up, residential secondary schools through the meaning of Irish for gifted young people from the Gaeltacht and from the Gaeltacht who had an excellent command of Irish. It was a free education on the condition that the students went on to the training colleges. To, to, to take up primary teaching. The scheme began in 1926 and the first group qualified as national teachers in 1932. Some of the colleges moved to new locations and they certainly provided an educational opportunity for the talented youth, for the gifted youth of the Gaeltacht. However, the scheme was criticised as a child should not be asked to choose a career at the age of 14 and stick with that decision for the rest of his life. And that's, that's, the, that, that's what happened. They were abolished in 1961, uh, apart from Kalashtamovi in Dublin. And around five, and at the, around 500 teenager, teenagers were attending them at that time. It is certain that education was provided to a gifted gener generation, both intellectuals and writers, in the preparatory colleges, such as uh, Brown Donohehe, Donohoke Lochhead, and Shavani Hulavan.
who wrote the following. And just to let you know, she attended Kalash to Ida just outside of Dingle in County Kerry. It's still there as a, as a primary a secondary school. Looking back on it now, it, 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 it can be said in favour of Kalash to Ida that it gave free education to so many girls from the Gaeltacht and that it enabled them to earn a living in their own country instead of spending time in foreign countries. But if it were only that, it would have done something good. But that wasn't the only aspect of the work of Kalash Dida and its fellow, fellow uh, preparatory colleges. Of course, over time, other policies were implemented in the education system in order to promote the Irish language. For example, a bonus of £2 was made available to Gaelic families whose children were fluent in Irish who were attending a national school. And of course, many of the parents, they, were, they, they wanted to speak English with the children because the children would then be, be going on immigration and, you know, they would have extra opportunities related to English. In the context of secondary schools, Irish was emphasized and bonus marks were given to secondary school students who, who completed official examination papers in Irish. At the beginning of the 1930s, Irish became a compulsory subject in state, examina state examinations and a pass grade in Irish was required to pass the leaving certificate. A competition was set up between the secondary schools uh, in relation to the use of Irish among the pupils. Medals were awarded to the pupils who composed the best essays in the, inter in the, in the intermediate and living certificate examinations. In addition, many people, of course, many people criticised the way Irish was taught in the new education system and the way policies were implemented. But it is clear from the, st the statistics of the Department of Education that the use of the language in the education system increased significantly between the, 19, between the 1940s. And we'll just look of the reason for that there. In Northern Ireland, it was a different story entirely. After the Government of Ireland Act 1920, the first Minister of Education in the North, Lord Londonderry, tried to implement a non-denominational education system. But the Protestant and Catholic churches wanted to retake own ownership of the education system, and they succeeded in that endeavour. Lord Londonderry also wanted to narrow the place and status of the Irish language in the education system, the so-called Irish language, as, as he called it, and succeeded in marginalising the Irish language at all levels, from the primary schools to university. For instance, the government refused to recognise the Ard School Ulthoch in Belfast, an Irish language training college for teachers set up by the Gaelic League, and from 1926 onwards, grants for the teaching of Irish as an additional subject in primary schools were abolished and the post of Professor of Celtic Studies at Queen's University was not filled until 1945. And with the number of schools that taught Irish dwindling, Irish speakers in the North began to think of other ways to keep the language alive. In 1926, Father Lorcan O'Muri and Michal McMillan set up the Cultus Ulla, an organisation that came under the on the auspices of the Gaelic League, but was actually independent of the League, really. As Gabriel Maguire says, Kuldasulla aimed at countering the state of disillusionment then prevalent. Members of this organisation worked hard to retain the Irish language in the educational system, to ensure that the government would not completely get rid of it. And Kuldasulla supported the new Irish magazine on Tultuch, which was established in 1924, which gave a platform to Ulster Irish writing and journalism and created a reading community in the province of Ulster, from round the Ferishta to Omid in County Loud. Colda Solo wanted to create a strong link between the, the, the Donegal Gaeltacht and the six counties in order to keep the Irish language alive in the six counties. To that end, Colda Solo set up a scheme entitled the Children's Committee in 1926 with the aim of awarding scholarships to school children, the, the Children's Committee in the six counties, to spend their holidays at Colossia Verida around the first of Donegal. Colossia Verida was an Irish summer college located in Omid County Loud for several years before being moved to the heart of the Donegal Gaeltacht, namely around Neferishia. A photo, a photo of the first group that took part in that scheme can be seen on the screen in this picture. On the screen, it is said that the Ogrianas in this picture were also in this picture. Seamus and Shosovo Ogrian, that they're somewhere there. And people from the six counties often got to know those famous writers when they spent time in Rome the Ferishje. For years, Coltus Olo continued with that scheme, and it was in Donegal that many Catholic children from the six counties received an immersive immersion education through Irish. 
Although there were huge differences between the status of the Irish language in the free state and, and yeah, there were huge differences, of course, in the status in the free state and that in Northern Ireland, the, uh, the Irish speakers in the north managed to find certain ways to keep the language language alive. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ariana. Very, very two very interesting papers as well. And now I'd like we're ready now to listen to Dr. Padraig Beolain and what he's going to be discussing. Uh, and Padraig, uh, his team is that the Irish language communities, the at the at the establishment of the of the state. Um, um, chairman, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank the committee who gave me an invitation to deliver this lecture. I'd just like to the discussion on the 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 uh, 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 stance that was granted to the Irish language uh, as regards from the establishment of the state in the early years of the state and and the adherence of the state to the new principles that brought into being and on its activities accordingly and support for the Irish language and its speaker community. With the collapse of certain empires as a result of the First World War, nation states were set up in Europe. The Allies claimed that they were fighting for small nations and the principles of nationhood. And it, it was widely accepted as a basis for the nation states for a century before that. That principle had a lot to do with the understanding that the Irish, that language existed first and then the nation and then the state and the state was expressed the nation. There were two main paths through which nations were connected to states. Germany's path towards nation state began with the 19th century Romanticism it was argued that the nation was rooted in the spirit of the people, in the Volksgeist, and that, that spirit separated them from other nations, and it was through the language in particular and through the custom and culture that spirit was expressed. As, as, as regards to the, uh, uh, Max Faber said that it was very important that, that people were a central part of this uh, in the middle of other groups. The basic principle of the, the basic principle of political nationalism grew uh, grew to the political unit, and the national unit should be the same. The, that nationalist philosophy had a significant impact on the movement towards the so sovereign nation state in Ireland. The slogan "Chirgan Changa Chirgan Alma," country without a language, is a language without the soul, mentioned by Conor Gaelge and through the work opinions of Porrick and Pierce, and the, and the opinions of Porrick Pierce is closely related to that tradition of thought. In that model towards a nation state, the German path, the nation created the state. The French path is completely different. In France, the state exists first, and the state creates the nation. The French model grew out of the philosophical tendencies of the Enlightenment in the 18th century, which included opening, which, which included opining about universalism and the will of the people and from the transfer of consequences of the French Revolution. In this model, the state exists and the, and the state uh, provides educational and economic opportunities to citizens, regardless of where they are from, and access to the official language in order to create a political union and, national, and nationality. The movement towards a nation state in Ireland was also influenced by the thinking of the Enlightenment and the French Revolution. Wolf Tone, the young Irish and, and some participants believed in this universal um, philosophy. Uh, a poet who, had a, who wrote in the 19th century that the myth was part of the shaping of ethnicity and there was a particular emphasis placed on the Irish language. Shahul um, Kachin dealt with the same theme in Forest Fasser Aaron, which an in integration of the old, which was which would be the integration of the old foreigners in Ireland. 
uh, the, the the richness of 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 the ancient language was was emphasized with the assumption of Conor Nagelga, and they were creating a new political unit. It it was short, it, it, and shortly a political unit would be created to join this. Uh, uh, Ern de Blyde made a, 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 a very interesting um, description of this in, in, in 1913. He, 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 he mentioned the friends that he spoke on his visit to West Kerry, and uh, amongst these were Sean McDiarmid of Bulmer Hobson, Shaney Lanigan, and her husband, uh, Eamon of De Valera, Parik McPherson Shkolena, and Constance Markovitz. Uh, Hannah Arendt, a political philosopher, comment on the founding moments in matters of state constitution and the decisive fundamental situation which the state has established. I think that the reading of the, the proclamation of the Republic outside the, of the General Post Office in, in, in Dublin on Easter 1916, Easter Monday, was the founding moment of the modern Ireland. Of modern Ireland, the state pays respect to the founding moment in commemorative ceremonies. But there was a long and difficult road to travel from that first declaration of the Republic to reach the independent nation state that was internationally recognised. To gain that recognition, recognition, it was necessary to demonstrate to the world that there was a nation with a national language and a common culture and that that nation wished to have a political self-determination. On the 21st of January 1919, in the Declaration of Independence, Dáil Éireann, Dáil Éireann declared in the name of the nation, it, it reaffirmed the establishment of the Republic. That independence was first announced in Irish, reflecting the ec ethnological basis of the claim, and then in French, and finally in English. We do affirm, this is stated, the establishment of the re the establishment of free state in the name of the Irish nation, and commit ourselves to implementing the Declaration of Independence in every way we can. Uh, it, it was noted that the term free state was used instead of republic. This was, this was a version of Republic in French and English. The version Searstad uh, had been introduced at the suggestion of Pierce Baisley, and it, 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 it was continued in use for several years before it was created insurmountable difficulties of un understanding. It, 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 it because that later created difficulties of understanding. Andrew Sokos said, uh, uh, with the Declaration of Independence, a new state had been established but there was one major difficulty. Another state was operating across the country under the British government. In accordance, uh, Dáil Éireann had political sovereignty throughout the country and the majority of people had definitive loyalty to their state. But the greatest def deficiency, according to Weber, was that it was it den denied the state status as a nation state and that it did not have a monopoly over, of control over, over a legitimate force. Britain had armed control in the country international recognition of the state and international of the state was sought and a fought and a war was fought to achieve independence the doll issued a message to, to, to the nations of the world and again this was done in Irish French and English and in that order the message focused on the distinctiveness of the Irish nation and its right according to accordingly to independence. It states, if the Irish nation calls upon every law nation to acknowledge the nationhood of Ireland and to have the, the, the virtue of confirming that nationality in the presence of the press conference. In matters of nationality, there is a fundamental separation between Ireland and England in terms of race, language, customs and traditions. Ireland is one of the oldest nations in all of Europe. You see here the emphasis on specific language and customs uh, and is seen as the basis for the demand of recognition as a nation state. Uh, at the Versailles Peace Conference, uh, uh, Sean Theo Callig uh, w w and, and Charles Gavin Duffy were sent to Paris to present the position of the, Re the Republic of Ireland to the conference, uh, uh, even though they were, not given, they were not given that opportunity, but they were Ireland's first, diplomat they were Ireland's first diplomatic mission abroad. In the picture, the two can be seen in Paris, accompanied by Margaret Igohig. 
A petition was prepared to be presented to members of the conference, emphasizing again language and nation and a difference of Ireland from Britain. The Nation of Ireland petitioned the Peace Conference inside the petition in eight languages. We, we request the Peace Conference to set up an independent state in Ireland. When the Irish delegates were writing to Hugh Wallace, the United Nations, the United States Ambassador to Paris, they wrote to him in French rather than in English. And they gave the title Delegate of the Government of the Republic of Ireland in French as the heading of the letter. The Government of the Republic made every effort to make the state function. A, dem a democratic programme was published and, the, and, there, was, and there was there was an overemphasis on, on, on uh, legal matters than uh, other matters. And a constitution was established for the courts of the public. It, it was laid down that rules the members of the court to be Irish speakers to the parishes where the Irish language is spoken. This is a photograph of a Republican court sitting in Westport in the summer of 1920. Uh, other, uh, other institutions of the state were also functioning. Various booklets were issued in Irish in, 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 uh, one of which was about, uh, was, was about fishing uh, and, and another one was about health uh, policy. With, with, the, with the ceasefire coming into force on 11th of July 1921, the Dalk was able to meet in public. With the ceasefire, preliminary negotiations meetings were agreed with the, between the Dáil and the British government, and a delegation was sent to London. There were four um, uh, um, had four preliminary negotiation meetings with Lloyd George in London in July 20, 1921, and a process followed in which comprehensive negotiation documents were exchanged between the two sides. In this exchange, up until the up until the, the up, up until the 21st of September uh, 1921, all negotiation negotiation documents by the Ministry to the Dáil were in Irish. Each was followed with a text in English, clearly marked as an official translation. This is one of the documents of which were sent forward. This approach was, was about asserting that, that Ireland was a nation with its own language and that the nation was entitled to have its own nation state. It also happened it, it was put through instruments in Irish and in English and Irish that the plenipotentiary decades to the Irish Free State Government were given a mandate. These are, these are the original documents signed by Emma de Valera on the 7th of October 1921. On the 6th of December 1921, the Irish delegates signed the Anglo Irish Treaty with Irish versions of their names. Two governments were operating and working in cooperation with one another in Dublin for most of 1922, the government nominated by the Dáil and the Parliament of the Irish Republic. And the provisional government set up under the Anglo-Irish Treaty, Michael Collins was chairman of the provisional government and the Minister for Finance in the Dáil at the same time. Michael Collins was an Irish speaker who was active in the, in the Gaelic League in London during his time there. He, he, he had said that the restoration of the Irish language would be the biggest task before them. In the slide on the left, you can see the minutes from the first meeting of the provisional government on the 16th of January 1922. You can see that names of those present were given in Irish. References made to another business that took place in 1922 when the provisional government issued its first public notice and it was in Irish. Um, um, some weeks later, it was issued. This was issued bilingually. On, on there was a, there was a further um, um, document issued in March, and it was uh, it, it was it was informed that they would have to be, Irish would have to be taught in Irish for several hours a day, 
and in order for the teacher of Irish. Uh, it was recommended then that the principles of the free state uh, uh, would be would would be have to be enforced through practices, and that Irish would have a, a central role in the state. A, a committee was ta tasked to draft a constitution for the Irish free state, and and this was the draft treaty for uh, for the Anglo Irish Treaty. And Irish was not. Um, 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 However, some were retained. Including the Irish Senate and the Rachtis. Inclusive on the 16th of June 1922, election day for the third dial, the amended constitution of the Free State was published, which had been agreed with the British government. Article 4 set, set out as follows Irish is a national language of the Irish Free State, but English will be recognised as an official language. And the the new free state, Irish language classes were established out the state. They were taking responsibility to local authorities and with the help of schools in the promotion of the Irish language, but especially to its teaching and the role of the Gaelic League and League. And the relation to teaching classes was gradually decreasing. The Irish classes were in the public eye and were described in the local papers in each province. Co written Irish was being promoted in the daily newspapers and in other uh, sympathetic newspapers uh, examples and there were creative work was being made available for example a new short story here by Padre Gokundra in the newspaper on Ser Ser Ser's thought. Um, the, uh, plays were regularly performed in the Abbey Theatre and there used to be there were reviews in Irish of them in the media. For instance, Eileen uh, Niakoshila mentioned I I in the book Ola and We Show that was published in 1923 that it was in the middle in the heart of the Gaelic she was working in Chewham in County Galway. According to the census of 1911, there were half a million Irish speakers in Ireland. And an interesting thing about this uh, is that it covers 32 counties, was that 30% of Ulster Irish speakers were in the six counties that later became uh, Northern Ireland. That's a, a read from the a map from the Gaeta Commission. But I'll, I'll go on, I'll move on. The, this map shows a percentage of the Irish language uh, amongst 60 years or, or more through uh, the 1911 census. But here's a picture of the Gaeltachti at the time. You can be clearly see how how much uh, the extent of the Spurn Mountains Gaeltacht is clearly seen in County Antrim to the south, to, from Rathlin to the Glens, and the Oriel Gaeltacht on both sides of what is now the border, as well as the other Gaeltacht counties in the west and south. The Free Second Month stopped the decline of the Irish language and they established a, a commission in 1925. In a letter to the commission, Queen uh, uh, Liam Crosley wrote that it was an important part of the national policy that a, a, a fully empowered state would be uh, in order to keep, maintain the Irish language and to enrich it. The commission re recommended a, a wide range of practical measures to improve matters in various areas. Among those was that groups would be transferred to areas with better uh, land, uh, which was done at a later stage. Just to sum up, one can say that it would be of great importance to the Irish language in the attempts of the Irish state to achieve status as a nation state among the states of the world. In the effort made from 1919 onwards to establish a state, in spite of the political and international difficulties, Particular attention was paid to the Irish-speaking community and to its needs. Sarasot Aidan recognised the importance of the Irish language and its role in the establishment of the state and took practical steps to promote the language and to support the Irish-speaking community on the, in spite of the difficulties. There was a rise in morale among that community. Thank you very much and uh, many thanks. Thank you very much, Padre, for that that inspirational talk and a lot of information there to 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 digest. And now we the 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 questions now have come in online here, 
And Connor has just uh, informed me also that that there will be that there will be a third panel will be starting at quarter to two instead of half past one. So that's that's just because we're we're a little bit behind on time when we started. We started with everything going on this morning. So just to just just quarter to two is the next session. So therefore, there's a few just a few minutes just for a few questions. A few questions here, and I, I won't be able to go through all of them at all. And and, and and it's great that there's so many questions have come in. It's a good, good indication of uh, that this is a worldwide discussion. I know always that Irish is not always the most uh, the most easy subject to deal with at a convention like this because we're all having perhaps um, gone through an education system when Irish was obligatory and the question we always have is about oblig obligation of, of the uh, mandatory the ma mandatory of anything anything being mandatory is over uh, more than anything else I see because of the compulsion and because of the the structures, the official structures that, that that have come in in the context of the Irish language, that we are here, that we're here speaking Irish here today at a at a convention in UCD, and I, 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 I that's a great thing for the heritage of the country. And just the just one thing that I would say is that. I feel we're always talking about the revival of the Irish language, and of course, the revival of the Irish was, took place. And it's clear, certainly, there was was certain things failed, certain things failed, didn't work out. But we are here a hundred years on. A lot of structures have been implemented, and the principal responsibility I have now is to ensure that in another hundred years, when the next Congress is going on, that people will not be saying that we. We are the people, we are the generation who are responsible or are blamed that, that Irish did not remain as part of our heritage. That's not to say that everybody has to be a speaker, a native speaker, but we have to keep an eye and keep hold uh, that something that's so, um, that's so integral to the Irish and is so intertwined with our culture of, of this country. So just on, on that topic, um, Cahal, you're the first uh, the first question to yourself, and if it's English, so I will leave it up to you to respond to it in English and Irish. Um, was Basie's enthusiasm for a translation service for Dial 8 and by the fact that he had to uh, ad lib the democratic program in uh, January 2019. The Your opinion? Well, I, I, I don't really know, to be completely honest. Uh, I thought that it was significant that, that, the, that the resolution was put before the Dáil. But you would think that they would all be able to add, add it him about a question about that at the time. And so much, so much choreography, I suppose, of something that was happening. And it surprised me that the thing was put to one side, the matter was put to one side. And I felt my, my, myself that I read it mostly to the... Um, just to, the appearance of things because... Keep an appearance of things because... because it was a chamber, it was a new dial chamber with new rules that Irish would have to be promoted as, as, as a demonstration of the innovation and of independence. And that was the biggest reason, I think, uh, for the number one to promote Irish and also number two to recognise that even people who were in the chamber that who were not able Confident. I suppose that it shows also as well to, to, to today that we're a lot more comfortable. I suppose uh, see here, there's, there's, we have interpreters. We have, it's a natural thing to come in here uh, with the, the legislation that that, that will be just as a natural part of, of public occasions going forward, and and that there, there was not not everybody was maybe comfortable, as you said, uh, the confidence of people in the language, the goodwill was there, but nevertheless, but certainly, certainly there was no lack of goodwill. Uh, uh, you cannot say that uh, at, any, at, at all. And even people who are getting, are getting cynical about these things, as uh, things, as the years pass, and indeed up to today, if you do a survey of the, the people of Ireland about their view towards the Irish language, there's a consistently um, over 60% of the people who, 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 are, who, are very, who want to keep Irish, not only in the education system, but as a na national language, yes, but yes, and just and just in terms of competency, perhaps we'll just come to you, Riyama. There's a question here that's come in here about the from both the, the colleges, the summer colleges, and, and so and so forth, and educational colleges. And just one of the things that, that, that perhaps that relates to the promotion of the Irish language was there a difference between the the, the, the printers? Now we understand the thing that our, our, our Ernest Bly, that is a minister of finance, and the way in, in the 1928 that the, 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 the typewriter is not available, and there was a huge uh, row at the time about the old the old um, uh, font. And just a question about that was it. 
difference between the, in the printers in so far as they pub, in terms of pu pu publishing publishing the Irish language and, and maybe Welsh at the time? And I know that this relates to, to the, the Yelp uh, project. And perhaps do you see that there was an impact, an influence by the number of, of printers and the number of, of, of publications on the type of teaching you were going in terms of resources and in terms of um, facilities? Yes, there must have been. There must have been that. Um, the 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 printed the private the education publisher was there and I suppose because they they, they, they had to do a lot uh, uh, put out stuff very quickly and they put a different uh, editions of the same books out and one edition in Irish but Ulster Irish and one with Connemara Irish and Munster Irish and so forth and there was a question there regarding about the the Gaelic font and the Roman font also. So it was difficult to find, you know, uh, to 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 implement the, the Gaelic scripture. Now, that changed over time, and it was more co costly as well to use the Gaelic the Gaelic script at that time than the Roman script. So that uh, that shows as well. You also show as well the co costs involved. That's just, I'll just finish up with this question here uh, about the um, was was there a, were the, the preparatory colleges were limited because of the Department of, of Finance or from or the churches didn't want that, educa that, that education would cost free education be provided? Do you think that was? I, I don't have the answer. I would have to do research into that. But I think it's a very good question. Yes, certainly. And I think there were questions, uh, financial questions involved as well. But, but I suppose uh, that you made a very, very important point there about the lacuna uh, but that, that the, the Persian College failed and the summer colleges failed in, uh, particularly in light of the lack of provision uh, of education at the, 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 the secondary level because not all the country had access. And we heard Joe talking this morning also about poverty of the cities, not only. And I think it's very important as well, those links, uh, to find those links, I always feel, uh, one imagines, imagines with the West of Ireland and is, is, is uh, Irish language or was identified as the language of the poor. And it's clear that poverty was, was, was throughout the country. And it was very clear, and particularly in the city. So perhaps... Um, Perhaps the era of the the poor mouth isn't finally going, has finally going away for a while. But a padre and and just the thing. Uh, sorry, now I'm um, I'm just trying to find the thing that came in here. It's the thing was uh, what you were saying about well, what is the reason for the lack of a, of, of attempt to foster an Irish language standard. Um, uh, uh, this question says to Foster, there was was laid out. I was laid out. I was, was set out in, in Germany. Why was there a lack of an effort to have an, a, a, a language to set up an Irish uh, standard version, as is in in Hochdeutsch in German and in French, for instance? What, was there some kind of impediment in terms of, of, of progressing Irish? Because we didn't succeed, for example, until 1958 in in in, in providing a standard for Irish, and we're, we're still dealing with it. Was it needed, in your opinion? Well, I think that a huge amount of work has been done by Ireland in terms of developing a standard, and I think that that it it came to the fore. It developed uh, as early as the languages, the other the, the spoken language throughout Europe. Um, I, I don't see much difficulties. The emphasis is always uh, in various states. The emphasis is on on the standard language, having a standard language available uh, for, for for official publications. And and state matters, state affairs, legal affairs, and so forth. But and looking back now, looking back as far as 1921 and the the Doyle minutes and so forth, the stand, there was a standard being implemented at uh, at the time on the writing at the time, and it was based on Goom was set up uh, shortly afterwards, and on the translation section in the House of Rockers, for instance, and they were focused on. Uh, providing official versions of documents, of official documents, but that doesn't that doesn't in, just doesn't restrict languages um, uh, to use various dialects that have various dialects in their in their writing, for instance. Um, therefore, I don't think that any there was no impediment. There was a, a, it was a natural growth, and it it really succeeded uh, greatly, in my opinion. If you look now on the European Union, I'm, I'm dealing with the documents in the European Union. Um, Irish, for example, is now an official language in the European Union, and you see there the the, the language, all the language. If you read, you read them side by side, the various laws in the various language uh, languages. You see that the uh, those languages are very, very close to one another in terms of terminology and so forth. So, if you if you you look of the language from which the 
from the, the original rule came from. If you look at the English, the Irish is conformist with French, which is in conformity with um, with German, and now with the Irish language. You you see a great a great impact, a great the language is greatly influenced in terms of the development and growth and the progress. For instance, as as a language which are able to to handle the modern modern world and to have new terminology and new sciences and so forth. So therefore, I think that. That that we have done very well in this country. Just to go back, uh, going back to uh, to the, the the start of the Free State, and at that time, just before that, um, the British Army uh, got, got rid of the Irish language. New, new, they raided some of the Irish language newspapers. Some of the Irish papers. They pulled out the machines. They took out the machines, the printing machines they had that were able to use the Irish font, and that was part of the reason why there was a differences from now and now and then between the amount of Irish the amount of the, the, the Gaelic font and the Roman font in use at the time. But as you know, of course, uh, there the, the, the are H's are, are available in the oldest Irish language uh, as, um, manuscripts. It's not a new thing that the, the written H was brought in uh, into the Roman script. The, the Irish were to the fore in, in modelling and developing art orthography, the orthographies of Europe. So that's that's many, many years ago. And that's the second question, just as it happens. Somebody has, has said, uh, you've just responded to many uh, 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 about the terror of Babel myth. And we don't, we don't, uh, of course, have to, to deal with uh, irony and, and, and all these things. But perhaps I'm just at the point now that perhaps, perhaps maybe one of the things maybe that relates to that, in terms of the the standard that we're so, uh, we, 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 we talk a lot about the standard. Everything has to be complete and 100 percent. If it's not, if it's not 100 percent perfect, your 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 speech, you're, you're not you're not a speaker. We're all speakers, and we must we must have some um, flexibility in terms of those those very very strict rules. In terms of as as Rihanna and Cahill said today, there has to be a develop a development available, and it, it has to be evolving uh, throughout the, the 20 throughout the 28th century has been evolving. What has come to the fore now, and the biggest challenge maybe that we have going forward, also is that the, the link the between the richness of the language in the Gaelic and also those places in terms of just in terms of technologies and, and so forth, uh, and and the, the to that, that that we always bear in mind that those areas are in danger in terms of eco ecology ecology also, and we have to be mindful of them and from and, and foster those links. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think that that's the end of this but this session. Has has a session. I'm very very grateful to all of you for your input today and for everything. Uh, and I enjoyed it greatly. I think I, I could stay here till, till tonight. I'm dealing with Irish. Uh, we don't often get to this this forum, a, for, a forum so um, all, all encompassing and so open. So very thank you very much. And just as Connor um, pointed out earlier, that we'd have a break now and that we we would have a lunch outside. I think so. Yes. Thank you very much uh, to you all. Thank you.